and I wish everyone fruitful work. And now, for welcoming remarks, I would like to give the floor to our foreign guests. And the first one to do that is Mrs. Ida Hoffman, ICOM CS Wet Organic Archaeological Materials Working Group and Coordinator. You have the floor.
And now I would like to give the floor to Ingrid Stelzner. ICOMCS Wet Organic Archaeological Materials Working Group and Assistant Coordinator. And now we're moving to the main part of the conference. The moderators today are me, Ilona Kardashova, and Natalia Vasilieva, a highest category painter and restorator from the State Hermitage. And I would like to ask the speakers to stick to the agenda. 15 minutes for each speech. And I would like to keep questions and answers within that time, should we have any. And Natalia Anatolovna will be moderating this part of the conference. Good morning, dear participants. Thank you very much for your interest and for coming to this wonderful place. We're going to change some of the speakers during the conference because some are still on their way, some couldn't come. And the first report is from Ludmila Kondo, who will share her experience. It's called the result of 25 years practice of using high molecular polyethylene glycol for the conservation of archaeological wood from the mounds of the Pazuric culture. She presents Department of Museum Practices and Technologies of the Institute of Archaeology and Ethnography from Novosibirsk of the Russian Academy of Sciences. Well, I will keep it short. The essence of my report comes down to basically presenting the work we've been doing for 25 years in our institute and the our successes and our problems when it comes to conserving wood from permafrost. So finding wooden items, including large ones made of wood, is a rare phenomenon. Much like any organic material, wood is subject to quick degradation and decomposition. In exceptional cases, archaeologists find intact wooden pieces or those that can be restored. The specificities of the mountainous Altai and the structure of Pizuric burial sites or chambers have provided for unique archaeological sites. 
Burial mounds in permafrost have preserved well. This slide shows one of those burial mounds. Okay, I can use this for switching my slides, I see. Okay. How do I switch it? Okay, I think there we go. There we go. And another one. Major excavation of frozen burial mounds in the Ukok Highlands of the mountainous Altai in 1990-1996 by archaeological teams of academician Molodin and associate professor Paskak raised a big issue because we needed to preserve large wooden pieces cabins from large logs, bed bases, pavements. The wet wood in these items was well preserved. To stabilize them in this shape, we needed to preserve them as quickly as we could and it became a possibility because of our cooperation between our Institute with the Japanese Cultural Center of Nara, which specializes in preservation of wet wood. Okay. And the Japanese Center offered us a method to impregnated with polyethylene glycol with a molecular weight of 4000 peg 4000 we did the impregnation procedure in a japanese impregnation bath pg tank and it what makes it interesting is that it has an air heating jacket this is why we could use impregnation solutions with a higher concentration of preservatives in it okay we need to go one slide back we need to go one slide one slide back the wet wood that we were working on and this is the impregnation tank or bath that I was referring to let's go further however the wet wood from the hole needs to be prepared first you need to clean it from ground impurities and you need to clean the open capillaries to provide for a free diffusion of the preservative into the internal structure of wood and you need to compensate for loss of water during transportation in order to make up for that wood has to stay in water until up to the maximum uh, wet because the water is the conductor of the preservatives uh, preserving agents into the wood Japanese specialists recommend to store wood well before it is conserved in the special tank with water in our case filling the wood with water was done in a specialized sink the total volume was around three cubic meters and the wood can take not more than two cubic meters the rest is the impregnation solution it's done with the heating and the solution is heated up to 40 to 45 degrees the duration is a year so the daily we add So on a daily basis you have to add um, 
preservance into the solution. In order to raise the concentration of PEG up to 50 to 70 percent, the actual concentration can be identified by the regular weighting method. The impregnation based on diffusion takes a long period of time, for instance, of the um, stone stones so was 14, uh, 14 months of uh, particles of house, wooden particles of house have taken uh, 12 months to preserve. After impregnation, the surface needs to be washed with water to remove the excess of the conservant. Then put it, well, wrap it with special paper and uh, then put it for, for in a position that will uh, avoid deformation of the item and remain it for drying for one and a half to two years. After drying is finished on the surface, we will have white, white dots of conservant which can be easily removed with, uh, with spirit. So, this is the drying, and it just lays there drying for two years. So after the preser conservation and after drying, the wood has natural color and natural texture. The conservant is non-toxic and it can be easily reversed. So that is the parts of bed and parts of the grave. So what is reversed, one hour one occurrence have happened so it for short storage it stayed on the territory on the open air despite good packaging and roof there was snow and there was water after water evaporated the white layer of conservative was uh, conservant the water extracted it with the rain water all well, the fact is not beautiful, of course, how we stored it, but it showed that PEG 4000 goes in well into wood and exits the wood quite easily as well. Basement of the bed, and uh, that's this was wet wood. A good result, what uh, received. And the bed have taken from the permafrost was sent to the conservation. When we reviewed it, we found that the, the, the condition was very good, except that there was some local degradation in the middle. There was local administration of biological of the body that was there in the middle. And uh, due to the conservation, the wood of the bed, it had, well, it had a very good condition, except for the that middle deck that was degraded. It became very fragile. So this method is not suitable to preserve degraded wood because it becomes extremely fragile. A big importance for the successful preservation of the wood out of 
permafrost is the organization of storage of it before the conservation happens. On one hand, we have a large-scale excavations and um, of the wet wood requiring immediate conservation. On the other hand, we had the only impregnation tank with a long time of impregnation. The storage of wet wood in the pool with water, the other um, cheaper option is storing it dug into the soil. Mm, it could decrease the degradation and avoid the sharp rapid drying of it, preservation of the wooden wooden uh, objects out of the burial, burial mounds of permafro from permafrost of Urkuk. So the burial complexes are represented in our museum, now and in the museum of our institute, in the Republican Museum of the Gorno Altaisk city. This is the, the same technology we used to lacquer plated uh, objects preservation. Wet lacquers have appeared at our institute when we were dugging the burial mount of uh, Nainulan of the northern Mongolia. The expedition was headed by Natalia Palasmak to preserve wet. Mm, wooden, mm, wet wooden articles of the Han, Han dynasty age. We use the same method to preserve them. The only thing is that the process of impregnating was carried out in the lab-based thermal bath. <coughs> These are the parts of the umbrella and the lacquered cups. We have, we have found many of them actually. And at the end, the experience of use of highly molecular PEG 4000 to preserve wet wood, it has shown very good result. For instance, in accordance with the data of the electronic scanning microscope, on the cross sections of the wood you can see that the conservant is distributed evenly on the walls of capillary system of the wood, uh, forming a very thin film protecting the wood. And to conclude, I'd like to say that the technology is effective, but it requires expensive equipment. And to conclude, I would like to express the hope that in the nearing future there will be new, more simple, but more effective technologies of preserving of wet wood of large-scale structures. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ludmila. Um, the big work was performed to preserve Pazarek um, materials from the burial mounds. A big, big work, very important. And so, Bazarek culture has a very is very important for our country, and this culture it has big connections with cultures of other nations and so preservation of those wooden artifacts is highly important and we're very grateful to Japanese colleagues who assisted us with the method and with the equipment 
and I see those things and we observe them great condition they are at the expo and they were temporary exhibitions another important aspect is that uh, those items were not only restored but there was a number of monographies done and the technology of the all productions and dendrochronological research. So the whole complete set, complete approach, uh, this is the School of Novosibirsk, what they do. And for us, this is a benchmark. And we are oriented towards your achievements and your examples. So we, we learn from you. Thank you so much for your work. And those findings, unique findings, and connections to other culture, this is permafrost, uh, cold conditions, chilly conditions. It's very difficult to work. And each wooden item that was preserved. It is invaluable, invaluable for all of us. And things really took very... Thank you so much. And the next report is will be provided by Ingrid Stelsner. Dr. of Romish Germanisches Central Museum. Yes, thank you very much. Um, dear ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you to my and my colleagues' presentation about non-destructive assessment of conserved archaeological wood using computed tomography. In my presentation, I will give an overview about the problems um, in, the in the preservation or conservation of archaeological wet wood and how we are trying to solve the problem. In the materials and methods section, I would like to present the reference collection of conserved archaeological wood at the römisch germanische Zentralmuseum in Mainz, Germany's uh, Leibniz Institute for Archaeology, which is the subject of the study. And I will give an overview about an additional investigation method, computer tomography. I will present first results about volume assessment and dendrochronological analysis of conserved wood. And I will close my presentation with a summary. Wood is preserved in water-saturated anoxic conditions where microbial degradation is slowed down. In this environment, the wood structure is stabilized by water. During an archaeological excavation, the conditions change, and these finds must be taken care of immediately. Otherwise, they will dry out, and what this means is exemplified here by a heavily degraded sample of archaeological oak, where 27% of the total wood substance is preserved. Depending on its condition, waterlogged archaeological wood changes its dim dimensions during drying in two steps by collapse and shrinkage. Above the fiber saturation point, the cell cavities or volumina collapse. The cause of this collapse is capillary tension with which exerts compressive forces on the cell wall. As a result, the weakened cell walls collapse. Below the fiber saturation point, the cell walls will shrink. 
The wood shrinks to a minimum of the original um, dimensions. The warping and shrinkage anis anisotropy is, are caused by my oops, morphological factors. Many different preservation methods um, have been developed for wet archaeological wood. In addition to various methods such as polyethylene glycol, we have heard in the uh, previous presentation, silicon oil, sugar, sugar alcohols, melamine, melamine uh, resins or natural resins have been used. Various drying methods have also been developed, air drying, freeze drying, solvent drying or supercritical drying. To gain a better understanding of different treatments for waterlogged archaeological wood and how and why the treatments worked in an international, an international comparative study of wood conservation was started in 2011 um, at the römisch germanische Zentralmuseum in Mainz. There were different um, international partners who uh, participated in this project. And this collection was a collection, reference collection was built up as part of a um, uh, project funded by the German Federal and State Cultural Foundation. Initially, finds from wetlands and laboratories in Germany and Switzerland were collected. The wood genius was determined. The finds were cut into smaller pieces and the water content was measured. The subsamples were documented before and after conservation. The dimensions were measured with a 3D scan and the measurements were recorded by with a capilla and in addition, photographs of the finds were taken, as well as time-lapse photographs, which I have shown you before, during the drying process. Five samples each were selected for a conservation procedure. All data is available in an open access database. In 2019, approximately 10 years after the completion of the reference collection, the Cutaway project started with a duration of three and a half years. Um, RGZM, the Römisch Germanische Zentralmuseum in Mainz, and the Lucerne University of Applied Sciences and Arts in Switzerland are project partners and funded by the German Research Association and the Swiss National Science Foundation. The research questions were or are, um, firstly, to, uh, the assessment of different conservation methods. The condition on the structure of the objects provides valuable information about where a conservation procedure fails and can be improved. Secondly, we will analyze the wooden structure. Dendro, um, dendroarchaeological questions can be dealt with on the basis of these samples in dependence on the conservation procedure. The, this knowledge, knowledge especially necessary when already conserved finds have to be examined. By means of both microscopic methods and computed tomography, we aim to get more insights and evaluate the reference collection comparatively. In for the following section, I will introduce computed tomography and point to the yeah, analysis. For further analysis of both the condition and the structure of the samples, we use microcomputed tomography. These analyses were carried out at the Luzerne University of Applied Sciences and Arts with a computed tomograph, um, Diondo D2. Um, yes, this is the firm. The evaluation of the data was carried out with the VG Studio Max software from Volume Graphics in Heidelberg in Germany. MicroCity uh, micro provides a non-invasive method to analyze cultural heritage objects. The principle of MicroCity is based on the fact that after the radiation has penetrated the object, the attenuation of the radiation is detected by suitable detector systems. In microcomputer uh, tomography, as shown here in the figure, 
the object is placed on a rotary plate between the radiation source and the detector. During the measurement, the object is then rotated in 360 degrees around a fixed axis. Projections are recorded for each angular position. These are then reconstructed into a volume data set. The reconstruction then allows the object to, to be represented in a th three dimensions after the distribution of its attenuation coefficients. The obtained attenuation coefficients are used here to determine the grey value with which the corresponding voxel is represented. A voxel is, is the three-dimensional equivalent of a pixel and the size of the voxel is a measure of the resolution of the measurement. Here you can see first um, results of dendro analysis comparing the classical measure on the top of the picture and the CT image on the bottom. These were carried out in cooperation with Oliver Nelly and Sebastian Million from the, from the Dendrochronological Lab in the State Office of Preservation of Monuments in Baden-Württemberg in Germany. The classical measure, measurements were carried out on a prepared surface in a Linear measuring on a linear, linear, linear measuring table. The measuring distance is uh, one is shown in the dark blue, and the measure, measuring distance two is shown in the red, dark red. The lower picture, um, the measuring distances are seen in the micro CT data set and marked in a lighter color. The diagram in the diagram, the annual rings with. Um, are plotted as a function of the measures distance um, of the ring length. In this sample, the structure of the uh, sample is clearly visible. Um, micro CT was able to detect all annual rings, which were also detected on the surface of the samples, and the data are in good agreement. In the next section, I will talk about our preliminary results regarding the conservation science. Firstly, I will talk about volume stability and secondly, about damage patterns and causes. Volume stability. In this diagram, you can see the result of the shrinkage of volumes of wood samples. On the x-axis, you can see the, result, the residual wood substance in percent. The higher, the more wood is substance is preserved. The lower, the more degraded. On the x-axis, we see the volume shrinkage. The volume shrinkage data are based on measurements on the samples with the 3D um, strip light scan before and immediately after their conservation. Here we see the reference samples, for example, the samples dried without conservation. The more degraded, the higher the shrinkage. And in this diagram, we see the conserved samples. From the five subsamples that were preser preserved um, with one method in the core uh, collection, in the collection on, at the RGZM, um, the subsample with the mean shrinkage was selected. For this diagram, we can assume any type of preservation is better than air drying. Further gradations are more difficult to determine. The 3D scanner is, also, is used to scan the surface of the data, which can be converted to a volume data. In this image, you can see the black areas to represent the surface of the scan. Here you can, you can also see the yellow areas that are not taken into account. With the help of micro CT, these areas can be taken into account in the volume calculation. This allows a more differential picture to be given of the method in, of action of the conservation processes. With MicroCT, we are analyzing the condition of the samples and investigate damage pattern and damage causes. Here you can see subsamples from highly degraded oak samples where um, approximately 30% of the wood substance is preserved. 
The one on the left is conserved with cowramine, uh, a melamin resin, and the other one, other on the other, uh, on the other, on the right uh, side, is conserved with sucrose. Um, the structure of the samples conserved with coramine is very well stabilized. Only minor collapsed areas are visible. In contrast, the samples conserved with sucrose has many um, collapsed areas. Oops. Excuse me. What? Ah, no. Uh, okay. <laughs> to go through it. Yes, this was the crucial course. The next one, yeah. Here you can see another partial sample of the same oak sample. The one on the left is conserved the silicon oil. The structure is well stabilized, but also details of the wood structure are hidden. In contrast, the structure of the wood samples conserved with PEG 2000 and freeze dried have many, very many fine cracks. Cracks can form from freezing process before freeze drying if the cryoprotective properties of the impregnating agent solutions are not sufficient. This means that the aqua solution expands during freezing, which leads to cracks. This picture summarizes the damage patterns of a series of tests. On the left, um, there is silicon oil treatment with small voids and cracks, then the coramine sample where some collapse can be seen. The freeze-dried samples shows um, many small cracks, and the last image shows the, the sucrose treatment with many um, collapsed areas. Um, in conclusion, I would like to summarize the lecture. The in the case of the analyzed oak samples, there are good agreements when comparing the classical dendrochronological analysis where, and um, the dendro CT measurements. Volume stabili stability is given through each conservation method. A finer gradation of the volume stability is possible through computed tomography. Computed tomography provides additional information about uh, the inner structure of the sample, in particular um, about collapse and cracks, what happened in the, in the structure, in the sample. To date, 10 series of tests in all and more than 80 samples of varying condition and wood type have been measured and are currently being evaluated. So, um, yes, I will hope to speak next year here to present more. Um, results. And we would also like to thank all the uh, participants of the former uh, project, which um, uh, therefore it was only able to establish this uh, rich collection in conserved wooden objects, which can be analyzed now. And um, also, yes, the database, which is um, uh, online in open access, which is um, The, yes, thank you. Here's the website, the address of the website, which um, can be uh, looked at our samples. Yes, and I would li also like to thank you all for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Ingrid. It's so very important research and very detailed. Um, and we hope that in future in Russia we uh, will do the same, <laughs> uh, the same researches too, and um, we can uh, to talk about it um, later. Uh, yes. Uh, Any questions, maybe? Um, I have one question uh, about um, VG conservation. Mm -hmm. uh, cracks only inside wood or on the surface uh, we were too. Um, in this sample, we had um, all the way through uh -huh. a very fine cracks, but um, this is only one sample, and we have so many variabilities in the wood uh, condition, in the which kind of wood we have, and this all um, to give a, 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 a answer about uh, yes the methods we have to take into account all the variabilities. So uh -huh. um, yeah. Uh, and I hope I, we will get 
-hmm. And uh, what about uh, uh, your? Uh, what do you, do you think about uh, the best method uh, after your research? <laughs> <laughs> what do you prefer? Yeah, yeah. This, this is also very. Um, I would like to answer this. Mm -hmm. This is. Um, um, yeah, this is a very difficult question because it, it's also dependent on um, what facilities you, mm -hmm. do, you have um, and also what kind of um, yeah, methods you, you are used to uh, work with. Um, I pers personally, I worked a lot with uh, PEG. One, mm -hmm. one step and freeze drying like you do in Denmark mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I was very sa um, satisfied with these results mm -hmm. but um, the drawback of each method has its, its drawback and here I thought that the, um, when you're dealing with very degraded objects um, it's um, very fragile after conservation especially when you have very long and thin mm -hmm. objects or yeah that yeah mm -hmm. And one Maybe more question about, about Sacros treatment. Uh, do you use a cold um, conservation? Uh, it was cold solution or you heat it? That's yeah. the first question. And the second, uh, what the finish um, percent um, of um, solution was uh, when you finished? Uh, in, in normal conservation? In normal. Yes, um, in the practical work, we, um, I used um, a cold uh, solution to avoid the degradation of mm -hmm. the uh, pack, and um, the second question was uh, about person Finnish Finnish person. The uh, Finnish person is 40, 40 percent. Forty only for two. forty. 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 So, so. Yes, mm -hmm. I try to get um, as much as possible in into the wood. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because um, when I, I, I deal, dealt with. Um, Neolithic finds, mm -hmm. and they are very, very, very degraded. Yes. So um, you need to have some cohesion mm -hmm. in, in it. M maybe uh, for Neolithic, uh, Neolithic wood, it's uh, not um, enough, forty uh, percent. Maybe yes. we must try to uh, more percent uh, with yes. Sacros method because we have a good result with Sacros. Uh, but we finished on 50 percent, and mm -hmm. it was better. Mm -hmm. um, so, <laughs> so I stopped you. with uh, 40 percent because of the freeze drying ah, okay. to get a successful uh, uh -huh. fast freeze drying, uh -huh. and to um, yeah, to not to to avoid the eutectic. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. So, <laughs> yes, thank you. Да, мы надеемся, что мы тоже в будущем будем делать. Yeah, we do ho hope that in the future we'll have the same research, that we'll have CT scans. And so the next report will be provided by Dina Gardyushina of the All Russian Institute of Rear. Chief R&D. So methodological approach to the conservation of the archaeological objects on an example of the vessel of the 17th century. Good morning, dear colleagues. I'm very grateful to the organizers of the conference so that given me the possibility to share with the work that I have conducted and that I will continue on conservation of the unique archaeological finding of the 17th century. In the fall of 2018, in the Vologod Oblast, the uh, bank of the Oneshsky Lake. Sorry, I have to work some things out with my presenter pointer. Just a moment. In the fall of 2018, the Vologod Oblast in the the bank of the Onevsky 
lake, uh, there washed up a shipwreck, an old shipwreck, and it was found. Um, the Vologodsk district asked uh, rescuers to take uh, the shipwreck further into the land, farther from the water, uh, for them to dry in the sun in the same year, in the fall, uh, the emergency forces uh, towed to one of base uh, by water. The, the, the municipality uh, was interested in this finding and they wanted to conserve and to preserve it and to give back its historical look and they hired the leading specialists in the Vologodsky Oblast of the Arctic Museum of the Exhibition Center, the Museum of the Karasin State Hermitage, uh, the State Research Institute, uh, including the one named after Likachov. According to the findings, the fragments of the boat were part, including the anchor, were built using an old Russian design, an ancient Russian design. Sorry, could you help me with the presenter? Oh, it's fine, it's fine now. It's working. The fragments were part of, of a keel of a ship made of wood by axes from flat bore wood were built before the Peter, the first times lab confirmed data. In 1632-1633, uh, the woods were built and soon the ship was built. They are sure there that it was built in Itigre because in this 18th and 19th centuries the city was a major shipbuilding center with two wharves, two factories, uh, shipbuilding factories, building up to 100 ships per year. In the winter time, In the winter time, this ship was placed in a wooden box. In the spring of 2019, when research started, it was taken apart, and before move, being moved to the hangar, it was uh, kept uh, uh, in the out in the open, covered by uh, this porous fabric. In late May 2019, the experts from Gosne Ear were invited to give consultations to preserve the ship. A visual examination concluded that the wood was not satisfactory and it had to be preserved. Immediately in May 2019, they built a hangar. Sorry, in late July, they built it and the rest of the ship was moved there. and. Uh, since August 2019, they started work to keep studying the state of the wood to design methods for its preservation in order to work out a method that would allow for preservation of archaeological objects with positive effects to the maximum. You need to use methods of wood study or examination that can reflect the degree of its degradation with the most level of certitude. An important fact here an important fact here I repeat is uh, that the pro destructive processes uh, that undergo in this uh, medium before the wood ended up uh, uh, in preservation is very important. So it will have spent uh, 100 years underwater and uh, then it was found and 
it uh, was exposed to air. When would objects stay in water for a long time, there is thermodynamic balance uh, establishing and the destructive processes stop at some point and degradation uh, in affects uh, the surface, the deepest um, layer staying preserved um, and it depends on the ch chemical, biological contents, uh, temperature and other environmental factors. Let's look at our finding, our boat, our ship. The Onezhsk uh, River, the water there is very clean and uh, most of the time it's cold. So one can assume that wood degradation was not that big at a low depth. And so this had to be taken into account when developing our technology. So it did, did not need to be reinforced deeply. But when exposed to the air, this uh, moisture-soaked object is introduced to a new physical and chemical medium that adversely affects it, uh, and it, uh, it's quick to, de to be destroyed. It's the law of kinetics. It starts out quick, and then it slows down. So destruction is a lot quicker, much more than over 100 years under water. Sun rays and biological factor oxygen lead to changes in the structure of wood. The worst thing is that when being dried quickly because of an uneven speed of moisture removal from the surface and deep uh, layers, there is uh, moisture tensions that tear the wood apart and the higher the speed of drying, the higher the level of internal tensions and the more catastrophic the consequences are. It's mostly important this drying for archaeological wood because its cells are much more saturated than just wood. When you go to this level of cellular walls, all physical and their integrity properties change. And that's why such wood is such fragile. And that's why drying affects it so bad. In some cases, in the case of small objects, it can destroy them all completely. In our case, however, if you, someone tells you that uh, wet wood was taken out of water and just left there to dry and then for 10 months it stayed there in natural conditions, you all know because you all work from wood, you know what happens to it, but you can imagine that. And this is what we also witnessed in our case. I need to go back. Okay, some pictures. This is uh, the front of uh, the boat, and there was uh, this long longitudinal fracture, and the ship started to break apart on the shore when it was being dried. Wood destruction and metal corrosion were noticed in March 2019 by Natalia Vasilyeva, who held did some big work on studying this scenic monument of architecture. Before moving to the hangar, the ship stayed there for 10 months, and for this time, the ship spent under the sky. In, in August 2019, it was found that because it had been there in a new environment for such a long time, it experienced deformations and uh, deep and surface uh, cracks and some other fractures and other processes. The state of the metals, and this is a, the corrosion layer that you can see there, 
As I've said before, wood degradation, when it, after 100 years underwater, starts on the surface layers. So, the most objective assessment of the state of wood degradation would be gained when studying the changes in the physical changes of wood uh, given the depth of it. This is our starting point for our method. In August of 2019, we took some samples and we did it at the depth of 40 to 70 centimeters in the lab. We identify the physical properties and build some graphs of independence and changes of uh, density of uh, dry wood and uh, moisture given the depth of the wood. And the analysis showed that, that the, the density of the wood and its level of degradation. And here we have to start or proceed from this. The density of wood or its percentage and how it's lower. Uh, then healthy wood, it was proposed by our Belarusian colleagues from 25%. It was the first level, 25 to 40. It was the second level, and there is four levels. So these are the degrees of degradation on all the samples was different in terms of its depth. These graphs may not be the perfect ones uh, to view, but you can see the samples there, and uh, you can see that this part uh, of the upper layers, its density, density is much lower than the next ones, than that of the next ones. And moisture distribution. Okay. So, mo the moisture of wood uh, on all the sections we studied, uh, given the depth of it, uh, was between 16 to 20 percent. It varied, which goes to show that uh, it was higher than the equilibrium of dryness. So, our conclusion was that the wood degraded not fully in deep but was higher than the equilibrium, so the processes of degradation would keep going on, followed by cracks in the wood. So based on this visual examination and these experimental data, we had to come up with a technology for wood conservation and preservation. As a basis, so we took the following things or principles or requirements. Reinforcement of wood had to happen only in de to the up to the depth of degradation without moisturing the uh, deep layers in order to keep it from uh, degradation stresses. So we had to decrease the rate of Wood dryness removal to decrease the moisture stresses that are destructive. We had to come up with a set of measures to prevent further wood cracks and deformations. I'm not sure if I showed that to you, but anyways. The important step here is use, choosing the consolidant, the method and technological parameters for wood uh, a soaking and saturation. So, since this wood, piece of wood, was cracked in many places, for these purposes we had to use water dissolvable consolidants that would eliminate the smaller cracks and deal with the smaller deformations. So, we used polyethylene glycoly 1500. It's a great material with a low surface tension, which can get in really good and deal with cracks. Saturation, the wood has to be wet wet, because if you do it like that, given that you set the right temperatures and have the right concentrations of solutions, this way you will soak down to the necessary depth and it doesn't cost much, it's very 
state of the art, so to say. You have to use uh, PEC 3250 PEC solutions. There is a concentration in order not to moisture the deep layers and in order to decrease the rate of drying. Well, given that, we have come up with this basic methodology for wood classification given the flow rate of consultants per one unit of square of wood degradation and uh, given the degradation depth. And in the fall, since the hangar was not heated, we could not preserve the ship, start to preserve the ship. So between August and October 2019, we took the first measures to de prevent wood degradation and cracks and deformations in certain places from happening. We treated the wood twice, even though it was almost nine Celsius. So we used the, the 30 to 50 percent of concentration solution heated up to 45 degrees Celsius, and we treated uh, the surface using sprayers. Since the wood was uh, kind of dried on the surface and was still cool, or sorry, very cold, we treated it uh, together. We he we heated it uh, and we more wetted it a little bit, and we used a steam heater for that. Uh, the cracks would be filled with polyethylene glycol solutions with a syringe. We got them there in order to prevent. Uh, the deformations and cracks that were there from spreading and we used uh, straps and elastic bands and uh, different other materials to keep the ship together. In the winter time, our boat was kept in the hangar until 2020. In the spring of 2020, we wanted to continue with the works of preservation, but given the, because of the coronavirus, it was moved. And so we started to work in 10 months later, give or take, and uh, see, we were following the same model, same pattern. First we started with a visual examination and then we took samples so to determine the depth of moisture in order to examine the efficiency of the measures and then we had to adjust for the the basic methodology given in vitro and in vivo examinations and given on the based on the environment of course where the ship was kept and then we came up with a plan for further works and the visual examination that we did in the lab uh, there were some conclu positive conclusions gained uh, derived from that, among other things. I would like to move forward. Illustration 13 is the one I want to find. No, first let's start with 12. This is the keel and this is uh, the wooden board, the long one. And uh, the good results were gained from treating uh, uh, an experimental frame uh, with fillers. But since, see, in 2019, uh, we didn't have uh, that much time in 2019, and the temperatures were not favorable. It was the ship was not preserved fully. But in a limited way, limited way, so some damaged sections remained. Mostly, these are the frames of the boat. The lab test showed that uh, it didn't uh, stick together fully, the wood, and 
It's down to 30 millimeters of depth, but uh, it's uh, the wood uh, values are lower and the wet wetness values are higher. And we have lots of samples. We have lots of graphs for lots of samples. It was there was also also an equilibrium of dryness or wetness, so it led to cracks. In uh, autumn, the low temperatures and the hangar, it was very cold uh, back in September, in Itigra, led to the fact that we couldn't work fully, so we were just working on eliminating deformations and uh, tying the ship together and filling it up with fillers to prevent the deformations. And we treated the wood only twice during that period of time. This is the are the works we did in, uh, fall in the fall 2020. Straps, bundles, you see that all. In 2021, we continued the works to preserve the ship. The effectiveness of the preservation works was evaluated by a visual examination of the ship and the lab examination, and it was found that the, there were some positive results and uh, for most of the both parts. We used PEC solutions uh, in 2019, but it didn't, but not completely. The warm weather of 2021 dried the wood up, and it didn't lost its aesthetic appeal. Lack of consolidants and a high rate of wood dryness uh, didn't allow small cracks to shrink. And the long wooden board, uh, it uh, broke down and the keel also broke. It had broken during that time. A study of the physical properties of the wood showed that all the sections were studied in order to reinforce it. Uh, not enough consolidant was used, and uh, so not enough consolidants. And the hardness of its uh, surface uh, which is inadequate, also supports that conclusion. The boards uh, upon which the ship rested were not hard enough. So, this graph, we're done with it. Uh, oh, here you can see sample 18. The keel is the only place where we have stable wood, starting from 15 millimeters. And then we have an oversaturation of the higher surface, of the upper surface, sorry. Uh, I want to go to 16 now. In this case, you can see some stabilization on the fra on this frame. It starts from 15 millimeters of the graded wood. And over there is uh, 11 to 13 percent. 18 and 19 please. Same here. You can see some stabilization processes starting from 15 millimeters of, but before that it was uh, uh, destroyed wood. But I'm just I want to show you that wood is not destroyed fully, uh, all, like all the way in deep. And you have to just do your math and calculate it right. And wetness also varies when you are at 10 percent. Next slide, please. During the winter and uh, spring time, the wood dried up to reach its equilibrium, give or ten, take 10 percent. The boat spends most of its time in the hangar in uh, natural climatic conditions uh, away from rain. But when the environment in the hangar is not controlled, still the wood uh, experiences deformation loads. It, because of when it gives away moisture, it uh, shrinks up, uh, it dries up. But when it uh, consumes it, it bloats. It's uh, very important. 
two things. Uh, after rain, there w- it rained, and then the, ha- the hangar there was not heated, and there were lo- lots of holes in the woods. And so the humidity level was at 20, 80%. So the equilibrium level was 16%. When the sun came out, though, and it was warm, it was 50%. But the equilibrium wetness of wood was 8%. So this number was very wayward. So if there is a, a difference in the rate of lower uh, layers and upper layers being dried, there is also a, a, a imbalance forming, so you have to stick to your numbers when you're preserving your artifacts, including across in museums, of course. I need to say that the weather conditions in July over the span of the three years helped us a lot to do all the works to the best extent that we could. Here you can see frames mostly that had peeled off. There, like the ones down there. So we were plastering them, we were using composition materials. So the preservation works we did in 2019-2020 gave us some positive results, but the processes we carried out in the cold period of those years were not complete, so by 2021 there were some wood sections that were unsatisfactory in terms of their state, so we want uh, we want uh, to keep doing the works in uh, a warm period of the year, which would facilitate uh, completely the preservation of this unique finding. We need warm weather and we need more hands on deck, so to say, Uh, not just some seasonal uh, subcontractor that does restoration work for two months. No, it's not what we actually seek. There is a tendency uh, for that things are showing that things are getting better, that the wood is getting better, uh, but uh, I don't think we've done enough yet because of manufacturers. And I would like to sum up by saying that the preservation work that we have done, that we did in 2019 and 2020, did us some good. And uh, the works that we will be doing in the future will be based on the method that we developed in 2019, adjusted for the state of wood, of the wood, and the temperature uh, conditions and the moisture level. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much for what you do and that you're not very beautiful very well, what we've seen well this is our presentational material and this material was developed in Sviersk when I worked here that's where we but what made it uh, please write it very very hard work thanks for maintaining it for, for how long Still, it will take. Well, we need just one summer and more working heads. Like half of the shift, people working non-professionals. So we come and we deliver what what we are capable of. So if you wouldn't bury um, the, the finding, you would not carry it around and not preserve how you shall act in the first place so you 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 get the finding what do you do in the first place for not so so it's it's impossible to well the destruction of layers we are binding it together so if okay we have a finding i wouldn't dry it under the bottom 
those wide straps and empty and I would transfer it in, in, in the water or in the first place we would prepare the hangar we need the preparation first but then there will be oxygen I would dip it into water in the first place so in order to avoid such situation big findings they require big preparation they require experimental work they require complete approach of different different specialists um, chemists biologists so pretty much everyone and chirurgists as well if you have a finding then in such cases we need to regulate it somehow because it's impossible to come and you know and clear mistakes made by the others and Valentina Ivanovna is now dealing with it and there are there are methods to maintain to preserve those findings they are complex and you have to have preparation for it you cannot disassemble it it's 22 meters this vessel including the steel parts in it there's loads of metal inside makes it more complex polyethylene glycol it can react with 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 iron that's in there so we need a com complete cross-sectional approach we need to have a working group and discuss everything such findings there are not many of them and you will not have you will not find you will not find similar vessels Valentina Valentina, thank you so much very acute topic very important topic and we'll discuss it at the end of the day now that we will do the short break for 15 minutes okay five minute break now for now okay we continue with our conference and now Rizda Habilovna will deliver her report, candidate of medical science of the Institute of uh, History of Marjani Institute on field conservation of archaeological individual findings with vacuum, please. Dear conference participants, I welcome you at the land of Sviyersk, and I'd like to share our experience of the express. Since 2011, the work on study of the of the passage of the northeastern part was taken with we or Starokuznichne. Balotna, Pisochne, Bazarne, among the Bank of Siaga. It's known as the Tatar settlement. In 2012 2013, there was excavation done of the total area of 900 square meters where we have found more than 100 of, of, uh, items of various times of the uh, 16th, 17th, 18th century. During the archaeological works from 2012 to 2014, in addition to volume metric wooden structures, we found more than 900 individual findings from one and a half in dimensions one and a half centimeters up to uh, two meters, and they had different layers, different grade of preservation, and the majority of find we uh, majority of findings was done in 2013 up to 600 units 2012 and 2014 128 and 184 objects respectively <coughs> the basis of methods of preservation of the individual finds we have taken the basis method of conservation of the archaeological wood from the Tatarska settlement of town island of Sviyarsk it was developed jointly with the uh, scientific uh, 
scientific stuff, graduation. So it was done wet by wet solution of PEG 1500. We did it in the restoration analytics unit of the National Center of Archaeology, Archaeological Research of the Institute of History, named after Marjani, in order to maintain the preservation. It was an effective system of events in place in order to transfer the wooden objects for conservation. For that, the items extracted out of wood, they were packed in the black polyethylene packets and they were delivered to the lab. In terms of short-term delay, the package before the sending was stored in the fridge at the temperature of 4 to 6 degrees. The standard process of preparation of the wood for conservation was during the stages of photofixation, measuring, washing, and antiseptic treatment. We were purifying, we were cleaning them from soil and dirt. And depending on the grade of preservation, the different brushes we used it. Antiseptics was on a daily two, three times treatment from the brush with a solution for two years after approbation of two types of antiseptic catamine one three percent solution of catamine depending on the condition of the finding and uh, I had to use the five percent solution of the catamine when there was um, a lot of uh, organic damage after antiseptics, the items were sunk into the distilled water to free the pores from the residues of soil um, through the fashion. It stayed there for two weeks, and we changed water after one or two days when the water became impure. The soldering was made by three methods from the brush. <coughs> method of dipping of the methods into the solution and method of putting in the sealed packages like that. The final method I would like to stop in more detail due to the large amount of findings in the year 2013 there was a need in the express method of uh, soldering of, uh, of applying solution. So we used the vacuum packages f to, for storing um, clothes, vacuum packages. So um, the items were prepared and then they were deposited in a specialized vacuum package of the solution of uh, polythene PG 1500. We sucked out all of the air and then the Preservation was done in the anaerobic solutions, so they stayed there for three to five days, and the amount of solution decreased. The next stage was in replacement of the solution, with a, uh, gradually increasing the concentration of five percent, then ten percent, then thirty percent. Solution in the inside the packages was changed four times. And we stopped uh, administering solution when uh, the amount of it was not decreasing. It was always at, after supervision to avoid biological damage. Such method of preservation, we underwent all of the individual items that we found, the dimension of which allowed us to place, this into the uh, place them inside the vacuum packaging. <laughs> the lab work with big volume of archaeological findings of made of organic materials has shown us a good practice on, and we <coughs> were able to uh, organize in situ treatment of the vacuum soldering of individual finds of a small dimensions through the package it was used in the field when we excavated the items the end with all of the items of preservation which were described above and then in situ solder, uh, solution administration was done in the warm conditions without direct solar light so all of the packages were inside the hangars After 
After the field conservation stage, all of the findings were given to the Lab of Restoration Analytics Institute of Archaeology, named after Halikov of Academy of Sciences of the Republic of Tatarstan, to conduct final stages of conservation, restoration, such as gluing together and drying. Also, the drying of a huge amount of finds allowed us to speed this, pro speed this process of processing as well. I developed the method on, on the drying it in the fridge, so with one week it was in the fridge and then one w week it was in the chiller and then we changed it to avoid the excessive, excessive humidity. We were depositing the uh, salt in a separate container, open container, to take the humidity out of the air and we were replacing the salt. This is the example of one of the examples of the use of the vacuum. I think so. Around 150 findings were preserved through the vacuum impregnation uh, in the field uh, with a solution. The successful success of the, such approach can be proven by the condition of the items for seven years and tomorrow you'll be able to see it, the results at the demonstration of the expo at the <coughs> Museum of Archaeological Wood of the town island of Sviersk. I would like to <coughs> give the uh, words of gratitude to all of the restorators who worked with our archaeological wood in Sviersk. This is uh, Mohamed Shanravkat his son Mohamed Shanvagiz and Mohamed Shanchengiz, Muskeev Bulad, all wood and individual findings and all of the logs. He was in charge of them. Alexander Belikov worked not for a long time, but was uh, had a very hard, hard mission. He was walking and so they do not extract it, they dig it out and the wood and that's it and the wood is on the sun and Alexander he was by himself he was pouring water on top of the wood consequently he made up this method when he saw that we are unable to do it and there are more and more items that we excavate. In one of the days, he was not in the morning at uh, the work he was. He said, "You know, we have huge, huge amount of work." He said, "You know, I have, I have brought packages. Let's try it, and it worked out as being successful." Zinatulin Artyom Chigunov, Roman, they had a. A tent installed, and they were looking after, and they were watering everything. And Chingiz and Vagiz and Artyom, it was very difficult for them, it was hard because they were the first ones, and they tried the, the first ones who tried a method of impregnating, which was initially proposed with, with spirit and its heat up to plus 30 hangars and that's it and the special we were administering the white spirit spirit solution in the heat and the, really the true heroes Vizgalova Maria Fedotova Julia all of those guys they have provided a big provided a very significant input and thank you so much for your attention Mr. Habilano, thank you for the report that you have provided a heroic restoration of all of the findings of Sviersk and uh, now they are a part of the main expo and uh, Great, so they're, they're doing great, they're looking great. The only problem is, well, big dimensions, and that is a problem for our country. They require preparation of the technical space and they require time. Restorators can do it, but for the large scale items, 
So if in two or three years we can, you know, restore the finding and they behave well, the, these are years or even decades for the large-scale findings. Thank you so much for your input. Thank you so much for your museum. And I really would like so that the guys would not leave the restoration, especially with wet wood. As we say, it's, it's, a, it's a long distance, you know. So, they have gained experience. And the articles are great. Vizgava Maria. On the fabrics. Great job. And large scale wood. Are wood, they're not that lucky because it was destroyed when it was up. It was in, then it was in the environment. There's loads of biological impurities in the individual items. They were next to the sewers and the smell and everything was there, biological contamination. So you need to look after the state of the vacuum package a week. It stayed, stayed for too long. It was very difficult to work with personal items. So, so, so there was biological damage, was a lot degradation. Well, that's why we used ketamine. We had to use it. Now it's in, now everything is stable. It's in the great condition. Plus, when the museum, when it was constructed, we looked after it. And on the recent visit, I saw. You can see the. They're all wet. They were, everything is wet. The biological condition. I was shouting. So the, the boards that would go inside for so so much time we've spent it, and then next to our wood you are putting down those boards. So we treated everything and. Our wood is stable and it it was not contaminated, didn't get secondary contamination, so especially after that difficult work, and to store it properly in order not to provoke it. So we wish success to everyone. Uh, questions, if any? So for how long did you... Uh, for how long did you store it inside those vacuum polyethylene packages? And before you put them into the freezer, do you wash them with distilled water? No. So the packages we can see warm solution, you pour in sometimes a day after the solution is sucked in. And so you just look at it at, at the state and that's it, visually. So the first pouring was 5% solution, it led then 10% and the 30% solution number of times until, until the wood stops taking the solution in. Well, thank you so much. Now we have the online in place, Katya Kafkler, so the Katya Kafkler, PhD, head of the National Science Department Institute for the Protection of Cultural Heritage. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, organizers. Thank you, colleagues, uh, for the invitation and for listening. Um, I will start to share my screen so that um, we can. Uh, I can start with my presentation. Do you see it? Yes. Okay, I see it. That you can. So I will talk about the application of FTIR spectroscopy 
to monitor melamine resin solution during waterlogged wood impregnation. Um, oh, excuse me. So melamine formaldehyde resin or melamine resin shorter is a resin with melamine rings terminated with multiple hydroxyl groups derived from formaldehyde. Um, so this is a one of um, common uh, consolidants for waterlogged wood uh, applied for over 60 years now. Um, and in the past, there have been some attempts to make this melamine resin useful for uh, longer impregnation times. And in the 1990s, uh, at BISF, together with Roman Germanic Central Museum, developed this uh, cauramine resin, which is now um, widely used um, throughout the world. Um, this is a water dilutable consolidant for waterlogged wood with some um, properties. Uh, its uh, properties are good dilution in water, uh, low viscosity between uh, 50 and uh, 150 and 200 uh, milli uh, PS. Um, and what is very important with small size of molecules, about five angstrom, which allows uh, the molecules or the, um, the consolidant a good penetration uh, into archaeological wood. Uh, this can be also seen from our um, diagram uh, on impregnation time. We uh, tried with similar uh, wooden pieces. Uh, we did um, melamine impregnation on three pieces, then impregnation with poly uh, polyethylene glycol and with saccharose, and the impregnation time was clearly the shortest uh, when um, melamine resin was used. Um, so the, when the melamine resin um, uh, should be hardened after the end of the impregnation process. Um, this process can be promoted by usually by heat or by acid environment. Um, the, um, during hardening, the poly polycondensation processes occur and uh, the three-dimensional irreversible structure is formed. This irreversibility is one of the drawbacks of the resin. Um, but still, um, so uh, other properties um, give the resin um, would um, be a good um, consolidant for um, waterlogged wood conservation. The acid environment um, it has to be um, uh, so the pH of the uh, red uh, the uh, the impregnation uh, bath has to be. Uh, controlled and the uh, possible acids have to be removed before the impregnation, so by uh, immersion in uh, demineralized or distilled water for longer periods of time and uh, regular exchanges. So that we, um, that the, um, the pH is um, as high as possible during the impregnation times. Um, so how the uh, process is carried out after um, the wood has been uh, cleaned by immersion in distilled water, by changing uh, a bath of distilled water, uh, demineralized or distilled water is mixed together with melamine resin, triethylene glycol, uh, urea, and possible addition uh, of triethanol amine, which acts as basic buffer and slows down the polycondensation processes. Um, so uh, during the impregnation, reg regular measurements of uh, solution properties um, are uh, carried out, especially the pH measurements and the turbidity test. This is a test when um, we pour uh, uh, some drops of our impregnation uh, bath into uh, tap water. If the water um, stays clear, uh, the resin is still can be used. But if the water gets turbid, um, the uh, impregnation process has to be terminated. Since there uh, a risk exists to uh, that the resin can um, 
uh, lay on the surface of wood. Uh, after uh, the impregnation process is ended, uh, the curing is um, carried out at higher temperatures, around 50 degrees Celsius, uh, and in wet conditions to prevent um, water evaporation during heating, and the uh, drying process starts only later. But as I told already, uh, if the bath is too acid, uh, some problems can occur, uh, like here, um, uh, uh, so setting the, um, uh, the cure resin on the surface of um, waterlogged wood, of the conserved wood pieces, um, which of course is not good neither for um, the visible part of the um, uh, object or uh, it's not good because the resin stops penetrating into the structure which we want. So this this is what we want to prevent by pH measurement, by turbidity test, and um, we also wanted to see if FTIR measurements could help us um, to prevent such, um, such problems. So um, we um, did the analysis um, of uh, um, a resin, uh, impregnated uh, resin, um, uh, by FTIR. Um, on KBR uh, pellet, we uh, put a droplet of our um, resin solution and monitored its um, um, spectra. Um, in the past, we did it with pure melamine resin and we had good results by um, differentiating um, uh, new resin or um, uh, unpolymerized resin with the cured one. So we expected similar uh, results also with resin solution with all the other materials added that I listed before. Um, but uh, it turned out that the spectra uh, differ from pure melamine, of course, uh, <laughs> Uh, we have other uh, materials added, so we had to choose different peaks, uh, which could be representative, um, which could be observed during the uh, impregnation time. So, um, first we started with freshly prepared uh, resin solution, and we, uh, we did a, a comparison of a uh, new resin in black line um, with a uh, comparison um, of older resin, uh, which has been stored for several years, uh, and but freshly prepared at the time of measurement. Um, we couldn't see any uh, very visible differences between those two resins. Uh, so this is not an um, information that could say that could tell us, okay, don't use this resin; uh, it is too old already, and it will it will polymerize very quickly. Um, unfortunately, this would be uh, a great warning, but unfortunately, uh, it didn't uh, show up that it could be helpful. So we compared um, uh, our. Uh, uh, fresh prepared uh, solutions with already cured resin and we saw that there is a difference in this band at 1332. Um, oh, excuse me, this one is okay. Uh, so, um, and the broadening of this area between 1300 and 1400. So we uh, focused first on this area. We chose a solution after one month uh, of impregnation, but the older one, so the red uh, spectra, the old solution, so, it, so we knew that it would polymerize quicker than uh, the resin just obtained from the company. And indeed, we could observe that the band at 1332 decreased 
into just a small uh, shoulder and the band at um, uh, 13, uh, I think uh, it's 13, 80, around 1380, uh, started to broaden and uh, um, uh, yes, started to broaden. So then we continued the analysis and we waited until the turbidity test was positive. So this is a positive turbidity test, you see, with um, it's, it, the water uh, becomes white, whitish, and uh, this is the um, sign that the resin will start cure on the wood soon, so that we need to terminate our um, a process, impregnation process, and start uh, make a new resin solution or start uh, the curing at higher temperatures. So what we can see is that the um, the resin, uh, the the FTIR band at um, uh, 1380 centimeters minus one broadened even more, and the uh, shoulder was still um, observed. Uh, uh, so this, um, excuse me, this is the um, then the sign that uh, the um, uh, the process should be determined. So the, the combination of both methods, so the turbidity test and the FTIR uh, lead us to conclusion that now it's the final time to stop. Here in the previous uh, spectrum, in the green one, uh, it was just the anticipation that something will happen soon. Um, and I can say that when we observe the same spectra, I don't have a spectrum, but when we observe the same spectra made from the fresh new resin just obtained from the company, like this one black, uh, this, uh, this shoulder did not occur and we could still observe a, a very clear peak band at 1332, even after more than one year of impregnation. So, um, when this shoulder is observed, this is uh, a clear sign that something will happen soon with the resin. Uh, furthermore, we looked at other bands. Um, for example, this one at 2050 uh, centimeters minus one, uh, 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 excuse me, 1250 centimeters minus one, which uh, we see that in completely polymerized resin um, disappears or becomes just a shoulder. But um, during the uh, impregnation process, the band that did not show clear uh, difference to this uh, to the next one at uh, almost uh, 1200. So uh, this cannot give us an anticipation of when we should think about the end of the process. And then there is this um, band at around 1,000 centimeters minus one, which and the one at um, uh, about above 700. Um, for these two, we still need to um, interpret the results of the FTIR spectra um, to see if they could be of any help to us uh, with the uh, process of um, impregnation process. So I would like to thank everyone for your attention and to organizers to let me present my research. Um, Katya, thank you very much for your interesting, very interesting uh, um, uh, speech and presentation. Um, do you have questions? Uh, we haven't any question of <laughs> Katya. Okay. And um, uh, see you. you next time, Katya. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next uh, speaker now. It's about preservation of waterlogged uh, wood from excavations in the Moktensk. Something to 19. It's Vasily Nikolaevich Matveev, who will be who's a candidate of historical, who's a senior chief um, 
correspondent of the sector of architecture, archaeology, also Petr Rigorovich, is he in Zoom with us? And it's called Conservation of Waterlocked Archaeological Wood from Archaeological Excavation at Okta Cape. And it's located in the center of St. Petersburg, 12 kilometers away from uh, the Neva mouth and from the medieval centuries. Uh, it's uh, the center of agglomeration of the Prenizhny Pirave. The first excavation started in 1992. In 2002, it uh, was placed under security in 2006 to 2009 when Gazprom was planning some constructions on the Cape, uh, excavations which were major were done over 325,000 square meters, sorry, uh, just uh, 325 square meters, where some wood, medieval wood was found from early New Age times. I should say, and let's look at this scheme here, the diagram. So here we have the early metal neolith times early steel age, uh, early 14th um, century excavations and the Ninshan's castle layers of the 18th century and uh, some parts of the wharf that was there of the 19th century. The organic safety there depended not on the time period because fortifications uh, were very deep, but on the depth of laying. The lower they were, the better they stayed about at about three meters from water. It was, uh, there was no wood, 2.5 uh, not so much. At 1.5, uh, there were some of them. Ex exactly where we found uh, the, some of the castles uh, were some items and the fortification elements pr were preserved. The earliest elements uh, were the remnants of the fishing structures of the Neolith times uh, that were pegs in the ground uh, and mats between them uh, tied together by these uh, little stakes. Uh, the tunnels of the castle of Lanskron stayed there. These were these uh, poles uh, that were laying there not to slide down. And some of them were preserved. There were these uh, Lanskron castle sand uh, platform where we found some good treated, well treated uh, logs that were intact. Uh, some of the tunnels also pres were preserved of the, from the 17th century. They were at the bottom by the wall. So the structures up there like parts of the secret passages, uh, the windows and the facings. Uh, in the center you have remnants of platforms for shooting at the slopes and the parts of the roof that went down. And it's all it all looks uh, like ash now, like rot. And we also found on the Cape uh, and preserved three structures. The first of them is a tower, or the base of a tower, 1300, 1301, uh, a big cabin, 3.8 meters in height. We found these logs on the right. It's the upper part of the cabin. And it must be the structure that the writings refer to in the Keller. The Keller writings referred to, and this was the last place where the Swedish uh, garrison defended itself in the 12th century. Also found this well. It's a square shaped cabin, three meters high, three meters deep, and uh, sorry, in length. And also found this pyramid-shaped cabin. When we were studying the structure, 
we took some samples and we came up with these dendrological scales, some separate that were local for the Neolith period and two for the New Age and the Medieval times, for Lanskron and for New Enchants. And the Lanskron scale allowed us to establish the benchmark Nizhigorovsk scale. The GAT findings were also of importance. It was in the lower platform. Organics were well preserved. The leaves, their edges, which allowed us to identify what they were made of. And the dendrological examination helped us with this. But structure is one thing. The second part is the miscellaneous elements. Here we have a table that shows these elements we found about 470 items from medieval times and 130 from the Neolith times. These poles from the Neolith times, floaters made of stone and entwined, and also these boxes. And more diverse are items from later times, like sh the symmetrical shape, which is characteristic, which is typical. What's also interesting is these rare findings of uh, stretchers. 1300 from 1900, and a wagon from the Ninchan's castle. Sorry, card from the Ninchat castle. They have handles interconnected. And they use boards there, wooden boards, lots of uh, boxes. Uh, and these uh, poles to carry things and uh, barrels like this one, and this one is of later times, which is smaller than the previous ones. They also used things like that, small shovels and shovels for sandy uh, cargo material. A rope is a unique finding from the early 14th century that was preserved in many fragments. Another interesting item is wheel fragments. Seven parts were found in the Lanskron Castle Tower. They were reconstructed into two items, uh, 105-95 centimeters, and the piece in the middle was made of from the same wood together with the axis, so maybe they were not part of the wheels. But they were used uh, not for, uh, not for carts, but for mechanisms that lifted water. And the other one is from a wagon a cart. Lots of uh, homemade tools, bags, woven and not woven, small stuff, uh, china fragments, handles. Some uh, leather, which was well preserved, and some foot pedals like this, and these shaped uh, things that we could not interpret. Maybe they had to do with weaving. And also oars on the left from uh, the Lanceron and on the right from the Optinsk Wharf that was there. It's a 19th century. It's uh, looks like modern oars or paddles, mostly. And Irina Natalevna will tell about preservation. The illustrations show that it took us three years of hard work, which lasted well into future periods. Um, wood was in different shapes of preservation in terms of dryness and density and uh, uh, kinds and types and sizes. Uh, we looked at wood uh, only from uh, wetness content, uh, the layer, 
Uh, would give us control examples, uh, samples. We would do tests, and um, we were basically following the criteria of our foreign colleagues, like Mary Florin, which has their distribution for of uh, witness and preservation. What was less than seven percent was dried uh, in the daytime in the sand. Uh, we were monitoring the whole thing, and control samples so were always there. Uh, the bulk of the items needed uh, impregnation, and we went ahead with full impregnation of polyethylene glycolum 115.00 for that peg. And the way we came at it in the field where we were, were working, the semi field uh, conditions where we were working, we put together wooden boxes, covered them with a number of layers of polyethylene. There, first, we put findings. First, the uh, findings were in water, cleaned. Then, they were put in 10% polyethylene glycol, and the concentration went up because of natural dissipation, uh, evaporation of solution. We were all monitoring it, of course, and then we had uh, covers for adjusting uh, the evapora solution evaporation level and when the water was evaporating the concentration was grow growing so the concentration was growing yes and um, this level of the solution went down to a certain point and we would always put it up keep it at 10 percent and we were decrease increasing the level of concentration slowly but it was uh, good we restored many findings the final concentration was 80 to 90 percent depending on the situation then we all put it in pegs, uh, sorry, in fi filtering paper, in fabric, we dried it in sand in the atmosphere, and we always monitored the weight. All the items preserve their shape uh, and their surfaces, and you are welcome to study them uh, if you are into studying the technologies of um, ancient uh, manufacturing. Some of them are exhibits, and they are well preserved. Another preservation item, another way of preservation, mm, were not so good, so we had to put them back in the ground, which was the best thing we could do. Some concluding words. On the the opting scape uh, gave us new interesting information about fortific the fortification structures there. It used to be there and, and it gave us many new findings and some individual organic items uh, which we have passed over to the state hermitage uh, and some of them were on display on the first on, on May this year. First category items, uh, structure and structures, uh, st structures and structure elements, we're still working on them. The fate of the Optons Cape is still undecided, and but these exhibits should, uh, they belong in a natural museum uh, that we hope will be established on the site of this cape. Should you have any questions, we are there for you. The poles have been restored, and the question was whether the poles had been restored, but uh, no microphone was used. But nearly if you have to impregnate it since it was in the lower layers, but since they were in the lower layers, they uh, stayed well, they stayed uh, in a good shape. And there were different sizes, from small to 10 meter long ones. Let's keep going at the uh, speech by Ida Hoffman, leading specialist of restoration from Lagla Museum, Denmark, and a coordinator of the group of wet organic archaeological materials working group ECOMCC.
Hello again, and uh, thank you for letting me talk to you about um, some work we've done in Denmark. I'll start off with just telling you that the standard method of uh, conservation we are using uh, is impregnation with PEG 2000 and followed by freeze drying. And uh, this object I'm going to talk to you about was just going to be the conservation of uh, like a standard method that we, we use uh, very frequently. And sometimes, as you know, in conservation, things do not always proceed as, um, as you think they should. So, I'm going to talk to you about a um, early medieval sea barrier structure situated in Hellness on the island of Funen in Denmark, and the uh, conservation of most of the recent finds from this site. You'll see here the map of, uh, more or less a map of Denmark. Denmark has a coastline, of, even though it is a tiny, tiny country, it's got a coastline of 7,400 kilometers in length, partly due to its many islands. And there are lots of many natural inlets and harbors. These have in the past been used strategically uh, by local people and persons of authority. And in order to protect these sites from unwanted attention and uh, access, sea barriers could be put in place and have been previously. These could be made of stone, wood, or even sunken boats. Some of you might have heard about the Viking boats uh, placed in Roskilde Fjord, uh, which were found in the 1960s. One such barrier is found on Hellness and Funen. As you can see, there's a small brown dot where that is. Um, and um, the sea barriers known in Denmark, they date from the Iron Age for around, from around 2000 before our time to well into the medieval period. The Hellness barrier was identified as a, as a barrier by archaeologists in the 1960s after they had been, a, made, been made aware that pieces of wood from the structure had been found washed up on the seashore. Um, and you can see on the, to, the, uh, to the right, you can see where the, uh, there's a green line. That's where the, the barrier was. Uh, an archaeological excavation was made by the National Museum of Denmark in 1972. Uh, and several of the pieces from this site has been radiocarbon dated to between 1150 to 1260. There's a line drawing of the construction. Um, so you can see it's constructed of wooden uprights placed horizontally into the seabed and there's a hole with a slot um, on the upright and um, you have the floater and that can be placed uh, on, top of the, uh, on top of these uprights, so in, in fact you have a, uh, a solid barrier really. There are made gaps, so those who live in the area, who use the, uh, the sea around there, they know how to navigate, but uh, it can stop unwanted um, attention from people you do not want to, uh, to enter the area. Several of the pieces of these structures uh, have since been, uh, the excavation have been found, I said, um, initially, and um, they are normally now being brought back to the museum, the Langlands Museum and the Conservation Lab where I work. Langlands Museum is responsible for the water in relation to the marine archaeology around Funen down to the border uh, to Germany. The floater, which is the latest find, was found on the beach, still in an archaeological state, and brought to the conservation lab by our archaeologist, marine archaeologist. We have a procedure. He places the floaters or whatever objects he comes in with in the tank with water. And uh, the object, I always do a wood ID. This uh, timber was identified as beach. And we change the water periodically, and then we wait for funding to come through. Uh, we can't just conserve things when they come in. We often have to wait one, two years for the money, for the funding to, uh, to um, come through. So this was, was kept in the tank for a couple of years where we changed the water periodically. We have two other objects which have also been made of beach food from the same barrier. Uh, they had been found during the early 2000s, and they had already been conserved. Is that two? Can I go back? Right, sorry. 
When the floater was removed from the tank for cleaning prior to conservation, it became obvious that one side, as you can see, was much darker than the other. The lighter side was more uneven due to degradation, and a pin, pin could penetrate to a depth of 19 millimeters. On the darker side, which was better preserved, a pin, pin could penetrate to about 4 millimeters. It was presumed that the darker side was buried in the seabed, um, while the lighter side had been exposed to the, um, to, uh, to, the, uh, to the sea, so you had, we could see there was evidence of mussel activity and sea vegetation on it. But according to the archaeologist, the surface of the color of the floater had been similar on both sides uh, when they were placed in the tank. It was therefore presumed that the darkness of the color of the underside of the object was due to anaerobic bacteria that had been formed while the floater was lying in the tank due to limited or no oxygen available between the surface of the object and the bottom of the tank. Um, as you can see here, um, we could to some extent, well perhaps you can, we could actually to some extent modify the color uh, of this darkening by gently showering, showering the water with the water of the surface and it would, it would sort of become lighter, but you can also see it did not become as light as it was initially. So we started off thinking this is a surface phenomenon, we might be okay. What we then did, we cleaned the tank, we disinfected the tank, and we raised the floater from the bottom of the tank uh, by placing it on a couple of boxes, putting foam underneath the uh, floater to try and uh, create air and um, hope that we could that way um, stop the activity of the uh, bacteria. However, after approximately 14 days, the surface of the object had not gone back to being black, apart from where the objects were on places where the object had rested on the, um, on the boxes. So with the foam we had used had not been thick enough, so you can see there's a very, very um, nice crisscross pattern on the object, which is obviously not desirable. We then cleaned the tank again. We changed the water and we started impregnation with PEG 2000. At the same time, we installed a pump in order to circulate the PEG solution and hoping again we could stop the, uh, the bacteria by aerating the, um, the solution. Unfortunately, the pump was too large for the volume in the tank and the um, pump actually heated up the PEG so it was very, very warm, far too warm. Um, and the black staining did reoccur. So we found a pump of a more suitable size and we installed that and the discoloring decreased over the next week. After approximately another week, new discoloring dis occurred. This time it was not on the lower surface of the object, but on the upper side of the object. This was different from the previous observed phenomena and it was not only a surface phenomena. We could also see growth or a kind of coating visible on the surface. And you could also see the solution had become cloudy. During the next few weeks, the growth or coating spread to most of the surface and the sides of the tank became covered in the same material. It would have been really interesting to be able to analyze this and identify what was going on, but that was unfortunately not possible at the time. The object had become discolored now both on the upper side and the lower side of the object. Here you see the upper side has also gone totally dark, so at least now they look the same. The object was removed from the tank and the surface cleaned by showering it generally with running water. It was accepted that the peg on the surface uh, would be lost, um, but we would reintroduce some when we put it back in the treatment. Um, this is a, a picture of the better well-preserved underside of the object after we cleaned it. Here's a close-up of the cleaned underside of the object. The pump was removed from the tank and we increased the PEG solution to 15% and after a month to 
the peg concentration was increased to take advantage of the biological effects of high concentration peg solutions. Uh, beginning about 10% peg solutions, uh, you can inhibit uh, some uh, microbial decay of the wood, although you might still get some biological growth and uh, decay of the peg might still continue. Staining might also continue, but structural damage should be minimized. The upper side, after approximately about two months, has now started changing color again. This is after it was last cleaned, and we put it in the, uh, two, in, in the, in the 200, um, uh, in the 20% in the, in peg solution. As you can see, it is actually visibly white, uh, lighter. And this is the underside at the same time, it is, it's darker. And there's a visible difference in the color between the upper and the lower side of the object. Um, very much similar to the outset of the, when we started the treatment. This is very much an aesthetical problem if the discoloration remains after the object is freeze dried. It was then decided in consultation with the archaeologist that we would reassess the visual appearance of the floater once we had freeze dried the object. The floater is here taken out of the freeze dryer by the archaeologist, marine archaeologist and the conservator. And as you can see, the color of the floater is much lighter now after drying. Here you see the previously conserved wood from the Hellness barrier that we've done about 10 years previously. When these were conserved, we did not experience any of these issues with regards to staining or darkening or, or biological um, infestation of the wood prior or during to conservation. And I have actually not experienced this um, issue since, so I'm very interested to hear your experiences. This is now the floater after conservation. Even though there is still a small color difference between the previously conserved wooden items, which you saw just before, uh, and this floater, it's not visually disturbing when you put them next to each other. It was therefore decided in consultation again with a marine archaeologist who I work closely with, that no further work in relation to the color issue uh, was to be carried out. Uh, the floater, together with the other wooden structural parts from the Hellness Barrier, are now kept in the Climate Control Storage Facility at Langlands Museum. I'm very interested to hear your experience and to know if ever, any of you have ever um, come across uh, this kind of phenomenon. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Um, I have some question, but uh, we'll, we will. Uh, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so the next report is dedicated to the preservation materials of the of the Voja Lake. Natalia Valentinovna Kasarokova, candidate of historical science, leading scientist of the Department of History and Philosophy of Chiripavet State University with co-authors of Lukintsova Valeria and Grinina Tatiana, her co-authors from the Department of the History and Philosophy of Chiripavet State University. Mm -hmm. Well, I need to thank the organizers for organizing such a conference uh, and it, I've listened to so many interesting reports and our expedition, by the way, has been working in the uh, basin of Vongeins, the Sevlogosk Oblast, uh, exploring the Stone Age turf. So my pipe dream was to find turfs like that because we were digging, uh, we were working in birch trees and these findings were in the down in the sand and only stone could be found there but I wanted to found uh, but I wanted to find turf once uh, and I was working for a museum and I wanted uh, to see uh, bone items not only stone items in our museum we were drilling peat uh, sorry not turf lands 
and we found it in the Kiril district, and it's uh, the north of the Vologodsk Oblast. We found the uh, Karavaycha 4 stop at the Yeloma River in 2005. We found such findings at the, Mad at the Madlonia River. Our two main sites we've been digging ever since 2003. At the same time, we are doing exploration work and we have found a number of peatland areas and the Vosje Lake is located in a spacious place with much peat. It's a natural reserve and I believe that many more peatland places can be found there sites. My dream is to give this region the status of an archaeological uh, reserve so that they don't build plants there anymore, so that they don't build dams anymore. They were going to build a dam uh, the Svit, uh, over the Svit River, which goes from the Vosja River and um, fall, 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 flows into the Vosja River. Our administration was planning to build a dam there, but it would have led to peatland not being excluded from exploration works and if uh, the water level went up even by a little it would uh, deal such a blow to peatlands. The sites near the Pagosti 14 and 15 village are located at the Madlona River or on the Madlona River. Uh, we're working on Pagosti 15 mostly that is located by the swampy lowland at the edge of this village and the upper part is a pitted uh, is a pitted layer from sto the stone age and the f picture on the right uh, on the shows you, on the right shows you a layer of 10 to 15 millimeters from the Mesolith period that has been preserved very well. It dates back, given by carbon analysis, from uh, the 4th century before Christ to mid uh, 7th century before Christ. And uh, these are some of the findings. Most uh, of the artifacts have to do with the fishing and hunting. We have uh, arrow tips, most of them with a beconic head. Some other are there also, like sometimes we can see there are liners made from microplast. Like this, we have also daggers and knives like that. We have these harpoons and other teeth-like instruments. Also we have their hooks, ornamented items can be found also. And many animal bones are there and we're trying to preserve them also. The suprapel layer is quite thin very soft and uh, the findings uh, have d different levels of depo deposition. Some of them are at an angle and it's hard to get there because the suprapel layer we do it in several periods. If uh, the item is at an angle it means you can't get it out completely but it will dry up in this case. It was, but we cover them with bags. So with polyethylene, but it's uh, better to dig them out uh, all at once uh, as opposed to leaving them there for some time. Even if they're covered, still they're exposed to some atmospheric, atmospheric effects. Some of the findings can be broken. They're intact uh, to start with, but as we're digging, they can fall apart. Maybe, maybe, maybe it has to do with the process of excavations. Usually, when we're getting to the supper pill uh, level, we have to walk like this. You can't walk with your feet. 
we use small shovels. The findings are then cleaned and taken pictures of. Maybe it has to do with the fact, I, I mean, e even though we're walking there, even though, though we're using bo small boards, uh, maybe we're the ones breaking these items. Five meters was uh, the length of the excavations, uh, excavation holes, uh, five to 15 meters. But this year, it was only three meters. Uh, so small, it was smaller, and we used these little bridges. Uh, wider bridges would have been harder to accomplish, and uh, so there you can see old holes. Uh, there you can see new holes. The superpel level was thin. We were excavating from these bridges, but still, most of the findings were broken. I think they were like that in the ancient times also and they've been there like that all this time. Not so many illustrations, unfortunately, of how we restore items and preserve items, but I will tell you about that later. Once we started digging these items up, we started thinking about how we could preserve these peatland findings, treasure findings. It took us a few years to perfect and hone the method that we were using, learning from the practice of many experts, but we needed a major restoration specialist who could go on trips with us, even in the winter time. We always needed to keep a person like that around because you always have too much on your plate and sometimes you can't uh, get to the job of preservation at the right time. In Vologda a few years ago we had Quarkus courses for restoration by Svetlana Borshneva and it gave us a big boost because she shared a lot of tips, specific tips with us and uh, a lot of advice and we were we've been following all that among other things and when we run across an artifact, a bone one or a stone one, first we clean them, we take pictures of them, we clean them, and then we put them in bags sealed from air by a gripper. We use a gripper for that. Wherever possible, we store them cold. The bottom of tents are usually colder, so we keep them there, and then we Set them down in a solution of water and spirit. First, it's 50 to 50, the ratio is. Then, it's uh, complete spirit. And then, it's a paraloid solution where they are kept. In the last few years, we've had a lot of help from a restoration specialist from the Vologda Center uh, of, of Stepantsov and Grabar, the academician. We're trying to pay back the favor, though. We're doing some of the things on our own, but some things can there is no one who can do it better than her. And she's also sharing wonderful and useful tips with us all the time. Now we're using the method of uh, delayed uh, controlled drying once an artifact is full of paraloid. We place it in uh, boxes of dry sand and we covered with uh, smaller bags uh, filled with sand to be left there to dry slowly gradually and then you can hold it actually without bags artifacts I mean but we're still getting there we're still far from perfect and some problems do occur and apart from consultations from Svetlana Georgievna, uh, Olga Vyacheslavovna Zhmuris from the Kunstkamera has given us some tips and advice, and we are trying to put them into practice. One of the biggest problems that we have, which is shown in the picture, is this. Whenever your artifact is uh, dry, starts drying up, then the l surface starts to peel off, which is next to impossible to restore. So you have to get to the job right away. Otherwise, you will miss your precious moment, and the artifact will start decaying and drying too early. 
and uh, there at the excavation site we have lots of wooden items and wood also. We have radiocarbon data analysis uh, to establish the dates where this wood came from. So it's treated pieces of wood which, is, which we suspect could have been something in the past, in the ancient times, is uh, our choice. And we keep them in sealed bags, air sealed bags. We found a few items made of wood this year with this uh, little stick with a, with a sharp tip on it and we've uh, sent it to Hermitage because we could have could not have her started on our own. Uh, site Karavaya 4 is located on the Yeloma River. It's har harder to get there than to Pagostashe, 20 no roads even dirt roads, you have to take a boat there, 20 kilometers. Most items are under a, a layer of peat. Uh, it's just peat, not a village peat. Then we have a layer of sap purple. And then it's short clay and um, other things. We have our items in a small layer of sand. Mostly, we have discovered lots of bones here and uh, much wood also. Fishing structures uh, in the ancient uh, springs. Um, they had these uh, poles built into onshore clay. And these are two slopes of that fall into the river. They had lots of wooden poles um, or little bridges uh, they used to be I think uh, uh, where people caught fish uh, ra radiocarbon data shows gives us a wide uh, range we have data on bone on bone on ceramic char and the final Mesolith, early Mesolith times, basically, they come from, I think. These illustrations show us much, much wood. Uh, the upper picture on the right shows us a fishing net with uh, long wooden sticks, I think. Uh, we could not extract all of the poles from the clay because the clay there is... Uh, uh, very thick. We extracted many of the poles, but not all of them, and there is so many of them, I must tell you. And uh, since the clay is a part of the land, uh, most of the findings were intact, uh, horizontal, when we found them, in the soil or in the clay. Most of the elements are hunting and fishing related, like these um, spears, um, harpoons, uh, floaters, um, hooks, uh, fishing net, weaving instruments, many other items, among other things. We got to Karavaycha uh, earlier than to Pagostia. We got there in 2003. We didn't ra arrive at this method right away, the one we're using at Pagostashi now, but now we're also using it for findings from the Karavaika area. Bone-made uh, items are treated uh, in the same way. They're chemically dried, and then they are dried in a controlled way, slowly. What we see here is not only wood that has traces of treatment, but also some other interesting artef artifacts. One of the most striking wooden elements or items would be this uh, fishing uh, element, uh, which we call boat now, which we discovered back in 2003. The first thing I did, I went to Andrei Vazokevich to, from Hermitage. He told me to buy lots of spirit, and uh, whenever you're on a field trip, you should have lots of spirit with you. He says that for primary, preliminary preservation purposes, and I bought an aquarium. 
made of glass. Um, in a newspaper, I found an announcement. A person came to my house at 11 p.m. He gave me this aquarium. And this thing spent a lot of time in this aquarium in the clean spirit for a long time. Uh, and it was intact. And then we went to the Novgorodsky Museum and some of our wooden elements were preserved and restored in Novgorod at the Novgorodsky Museum. On the left, you see an item that is on display at the Museum of Archaeology in Cheripovitz, which is in our city of Cheripovitz, along with some other items. Um, and we have a few poles, fishing structure poles like that. We have this massive thing. We took them to Novgorod because we had an agreement there with the museum back in the day. And they were stored there, and now they're all on display, fortunately. Uh, apart from bone and wood r items, uh, Karavaycha four, 4 gave us uh, three fragments of uh, fishing baskets. So they were in the onshore clay, so it was hard to get them out. And the first fragment, uh, we gave it to Hermitage for restoration, which was a while ago. It was not in good shape, not so many remains. It was The weaving was very thin, and this is what remains now. And in another two fragments, we could not e extract them. We were taking them out of, together with monolith and clay. And uh, when we were trying to dig them out, uh, they started losing their structural integrity, so they were lost at that time. Kravaycha 4 has lots of uh, floaters from birch uh, bark. Mm, they can stay in spirit for a few years, and then you can take them out, and they can be exposed to the air like that. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Natalia Valentinovna. We have some more questions, but we have some questions, but we'll ask them later. Then Andrei Sergeyevich, you will speak after lunch. And now we have the lunch break. Thank you. Well, I hope everyone is back with us. Are the microphones on? Well, we're continuing. And, well, it's uh, the first snow this year is coming down now, and our foreign guests have gotten a chance to contemplate what uh, the Russian winter is like. And the second uh, part of the conference uh, will be started by Andrei Smenov, head of the Metal Restoration Se Center, sector of the State Russian Museum, experience of reconservation of underwater archaeology objects on the example of the collection of the Vyber Castle Museum Reserve. There are some things uh, that we have encountered when we were preparing collections for the museum reserve. Some background first. The Vyberg Sea Battle that was the turning point in the Russian-Swedish War was on the 22nd of June and uh, during the war, the Swedish fleet that could not get to the city 
receded to their uh, Swedish uh, um, part of the sea that have 50 linear ships, 2,000 cannons, and 21,000 seamen on board, and uh, they had a fleet of galler ships, 20 of them, 22 linear ships, 13 frigates, and a number of small ships were encircled with over 30,000 uh, seamen headed by the Swedish king, Gustav III. And wa they waited there for a month, waiting for the right wind. And on the 22nd of June, they decided to push through along the northern for direction. But since they did not know the local seafaring conditions, Many of them lost their way, veered off, or hit land under artillery fire because the visibility was low that day. Most of the fleet, together with the king, went to the port in s there. One third of the fleet was lost, seven linear ships, three frigates, and about 50 small ships and they lost about 5,000 men that day. Until the 1990s, archaeological works on the Wiberg battle site were not possible because of uh, the border patrol there in the USSR. But in 1989, the Leningrad War base under the captain of the first rank, Konstantin Shoptov, they created an underwater association. And in 1994, the Russian-Swedish expedition Aurora, together with the Polite Baltica expedition, were examining this site in the Vyberg. And they found the first linear ship that sank of the cult Elizabeth Charlotte. And uh, this is when they lifted the first find items from them and they started restoring them, preserving them, including uh, the items found on them underwater, which is called underwater archaeology ever since 1994, based on the, what was found underwater and uh, based on video materials from the archive of the war archive of the commanded house over 5,000 square meters, they created a collection of underwater archaeology that is still growing. Now it has over 800 items. The exhibits were mostly display the results of the many years of research of the Wuberg place by the Baltica, Panel Baltica, Polit Baltica expedition. It includes items from ships that sank in 1790, anchors, cannons of all calibers on deck cannons, fragments of uh, holes and other sea items and ship parts. In 2007, I started, I was introduced to this collection and I started working with it and I've been examining it ever since periodically. And uh, while I'm at it, some issues uh, that require some scrupulous attention arise. Restor research specialists are faced with lots of issues concerning uh, the time caused by underwater presence, like bio -dama bio damage because of processes when items uh, interact with uh, microorganisms and flora. C 
corrosion damage when metals and alloys are exposed to gases and salts in the water. Destruction because of sea and fresh water getting into the structure, mechanical materials, uh, mechanical damage uh, due to shipwreck or due to long-time exposure to underwater conditions. Another important factor is uh, lifting items from underwater, meaning taking them from this nearly unfavorable or stable state because of this drop or change in oxygen and microorganisms in the environment and other things which can have an adverse impact on the state of items in the first hours within of lifting and later when exposed to air. Then items are impacted by storage conditions and fluctuations in temperatures and uh, humidity and the conditions uh, determine uh, its uh, fate, their fate of these items and uh, preserving such items or underwater archaeology and a part of it is of course is restoration measures by specialists and it's gaining momentum because studying under seawater archaeology items um, is garnering more attention, more and more attention. When we started to put together the collection, we tried to treat the items that were supposed to be included in it, uh, the restoration works and the restoration schools. I mean, the, the specialists were not really schooled in the art of restoration, but they were really bent on restoring these and preserving these uh, ancient items to be put on display later. And despite all the challenges that these enthusi enthusiasts were faced with when they were doing uh, preliminary on-field preservation and um, with the mater materials or tools that could not work with the mineralized wood or metal, still uh, most of the items that we have now is quite intact. Uh, the main goal of the specialists behind this collection was getting rid of uh, corrosion, loose ends uh, and other processes, but in the wood that's been under water for 200 years, there is excessive water and salt uh, dissolved in seawater, some oil deposits and products of metal corrosion. What they didn't take into account, the chloride uh, crystal corrosion after surface drying. Some of the items were preserved by this, by film forming materials that could not later be removed. This locked the water within the items and it kept them from drying quickly, but uh, on the other hand, it impeded further restoration work. The items that didn't, uh, that were not treated really well, cracked mostly because of drying too quickly. Last year, the directorate of the museum invited me to do a regular inspection because they have restored the new building now and they're planning to locate a well-prepared 
collection dedicated to the Viborg sea battle and during an inspection made up of 800 items, give or take, 100 of them, give or take, again, requires some restoration work of different kind and complexity and uh, some examinations were made, some samples were taken, and the results of these samples showed that wooden items had lots of sulfur and sulfides in them and excessive chloride in them, or much chloride in them. The preliminary inspection of the items, depending on the materials that they were made of, uh, laid bare these problems. And the, some of the items showed or uh, revealed ongoing destructive processes uh, inside, like uh, because of the salts that I mentioned, despite the fact that after they were lifted, they were cleaned, the uh, layers, the destructive layers were cleaned or removed, but some of them still remained in the internal layers or some cracks or fissures, some joints or seams, and the barrels of the cannons from the Aurora, which is the king's yacht or boat, they found some uh, buckwheat, big buckwheat balls inside. Which we have, which are yet to be extracted, and some corrosion processes are still ongoing. A fragment of a gun, you can see on this slide, of a 34-pound gun. At the joint, there is much corrosion, and this hole there, and the steel pin that kept together the parts of the machine is full of corrosion, firm corrosion, ferrous corrosion. There is no metal there, it's mineralized, and it's all getting inside the wood. And the process of working with the of wood cracking and uh, coming apart is containing the impregnation solutions that were used in the first treatments uh, have shown various results. Uh, all in all, on the one hand, of course, it does give you some positive effect, but on the other hand, since it is uh, irreversible as a process, it's hard working with the surfaces of wood pieces now because uh, there are some corrosion layers remaining that soak through those wood pieces and these corrosion layers, they repel this uh, film forming layer which causes a number of problems. Well, at the present moment, the collection has about 800 items, which are preserved with various degrees of success. The building of uh, where they are kept uh, has asked for an inspection and prevention measures, and we are going ahead with these prevention measures now. And while we were going about it, we set a number of tasks that are yet to be addressed. And the first one of them is a full elimination of all kind of dirt 
um, all kinds of depositions or deposits, deep deposits, removing or thinning out the layers that were put there during the first treatment for preservation. The, those coatings actually did give us a good effect, but now they are a problem to us, like I said. So we need to work out a number of measures to stab stabilize the intercrystallite corrosion of metals and to remove surface corrosion, a number of some measures to stabilize uh, the cracking of wood and the stabilization of wood um, damaged by ferrous corrosion products, uh, developing a method to remove uh, dissolved salts of sulfur and chloride from the surface of wood after from the coatings of treatments uh, from some deep or bottom oil deposits and some other measures, uh, measures uh, to remove salts are needed to, to reinforce uh, all loose uh, parts with some materials we need and it includes all kinds of uh, joints and connections to make objects seem real and integral and uh, mechanically intact also and to sum up the experience I that keeps growing expanding always I need to mention that restoration works so when it comes to exhibits uh, it takes an individual approach and my own opinion is that field trips require an expert and a qualified expert who can basically provide for preliminary treatments so that for a time, just for a time, the items they find can last without any damage and can be taken to the restoration lab without any, any damage once th those items are in the lab before restorations works restoration works start a number of chemical and uh, physical examinations are in order to uncover some physical biological damage um, what's also important is creating a new trend or area in restoration one of uh, Restoration specialists of underwater archaeology with an official status given to this profession, if you will. And now I will skip through my slides. This is uh, a part of a 24 pound gun machine or base, and this was before the restoration work and uh, you see there is many corrosion layers on it on the right um, you can see it after it was cleaned and in the right corner there are the factory numbers and this is the axis of the same base of the gun with some numbers also etched on it and here these pictures show us the process of reinforcing surfaces with polymers to keep uh, the solvents uh, from drying quickly it was a way of sealing them and these are the threads that our colleagues have also already mentioned and some polyethylene to glue it together if you will some cannon works oh and this is the restoration of a nose figure 
the one that can be found on the nose of a ship, which is uh, a complex figure or structure made up of different kinds of uh, wood. I don't think it's oak, it's something else. And uh, it was preserved, but still it bears uh, the remnants of the original coating. It was either gilded or painted, so you can see the original painting or coating. The same nose figure here shows you this. This is how we're working with the surface of it, this picture. And this is us. This is. Uh, a picture of disassembled. All the joints have been cleaned, and we're trying to put it back together to rec reconstruct it, if you will, because the museum wished for the nose wishes for the nose figure to be put on display in a vertical position, so it has to be well stable, and uh, it has to be put on a structure without. any material that would be noxious to it. This is a cannon from the Aurora Yacht before restoration. This is a work in, pro in progress and this is where we're so uh, sorry, adjusting it off and this is uh, a part of the base that has uh, lost a lot in its integrity <laughs> because of cracks. And we decided to fill it up, to fill up the cracks. The two goals behind it were to give it some integrity of perception and to close or seal the big fissures and cracks to keep dust from, to keep dust away, basically. Some wheels here. And uh, this is a gun or a cannon that we restored with a, it has a considerable mineral coating here, so it's quite fragile, I must admit. And this is where we're impregnating it, and then it was preserved. The gun. Well, thank you very much for your attention, everyone. Thank you very much, Andrei Sergeyevich, for this great work you did. Lots of work involved, and this work is very very toxic, so stay safe. And I hope your team will keep growing and you will have new apprentices and followers. You keep bringing up all the sort of points, basically, because without preparation, working with uh, heavy stuff like that and rectifying someone else's errors is uh, a, lo a lot more difficult than doing the right thing to start with. But we can't turn back the clock on this, so we have to keep ourselves from making the same mistakes down the road, but still we're all, it's human to err. But this toxic you touch upon is very important, preservation of uh, wood with metal, but it's solv it can be solved. And I think at the end of the day we're in the breaks, so we can continue discussions around it. Thank you very much. Next, next speaker. So, the next speaker is uh, Natalia Vasilyeva, conservation of archaeological finds made of birch bark in the field. We'll speak about a bit different material. 
different material, which is related to wood, which is birch bark. We have lots of findings made out of birch bark since the era of the ancient stone. So these are some samples of findings uh, that are illustrated here. It's in different cultures we find it. And it is identified by the conditions of where it was deposited and what we need to do in order to avoid the um, the destroying of the bark. So they are found soft, they are very plastic, the surface is very, is very uh, tender, so we need to protect it from any mechanical forces attached to it, so wet, wet layer. Mm, it will live, otherwise we will have marks not related to the history of the part, and the part of the, it can get co collapsed when they take them out from the layer, it becomes plastic, becomes, uh, it remains plastic while it is still wet. And we need to erase it, package it on a very dense, non-wetting surface. So the, the layering and tears deformed, fragmented. To package those items, we need a very uh, big amount of the packaging materials. Paper tissues, paper fillers, uh, cardboard. The main targets of uh, field conservation is to maintain the surface and slowing down the degradation of the uh, items. So safe elimination of the monolith, and then we package it and transport it into the camera lab and then we remove the soil and dirt if needed, then treatment with antiseptics and then strengthening the material. We can do it in the field if it is required. And the last point is packaging and preparation of the finding and then preparing for transport. The practice have revealed that in the field you can not only do the conservation but the restoration of the birch bark items. And that's we, how we can see it. It was done during the fifth Pozorek Kurgan. Kazil Balchok from Mongolia, 13th and 14th century, a uh, burial uh, mount, and it was destroyed uh, by the amateurs. But then our expedition, we have studied the items that have given provided to the um, historical museum, and they have cleared the burial mount. Among there there was uh, the uh, the casing for arrows made out of birch bark, two pairs of of the saddle. So so the external and internal case is uh, part of the birch uh, or bark in the trapezoidal form. The external layer was opposite. The edges go on each other, they are even. Due to natural tear and wear of the material. And the internal part is longer. There's no lead on the surface of all the parts. There are punctures. In both of those cases, they are stitched together. The material of stitching did not survive it. And we... The birch... There's a slate, uh, bone slate and a wooden plank. It's dry, it's dense, it cannot be folded, the item is fragmented. Also on the sides and among the sewers, there are losses on the sides and on top of it. 
soils and dirt and the main stages of restoration works they included the uh, day installation the internal we have removed it from the external part of it then with the natural sponge with water we removed the dirt then we plastified the birch bark and when we have plastified it to so we were sprinkling it with water and then putting it inside the polyethylene and in parallel among it this, um, with warm water so we have created there was uh, when it is uh, quite warm and it is humid so the birch bark becomes uh, plastic and we use weights like sand and we dry it in the compressed amount we use Lascos 498-20X we did also ton with the more dense in more dense places and gluing of the stitches we did the same with glue as caught 478 when it was finally done we were able to assemble to install everything and we have decided that those stone and wooden plates they were restored separately we have decided that they will just put them on top we will not connect it and it's great for research for drawing and for for deliverance of the other works with other few um, there were uh, birch bark from the saddle shelves also that burial had remains of two saddles and two couples of uh, birch bark things. and they were flat it was easier to work with them we removed the dirt first then we sprinkle it with water we put a uh, hot um, we glue we press it we uh, create a form and we have eliminated the deformation and out of the field they were exiting as the final final items finalized items and many museums there are no restorators on the spot and things need to be restored especially when birch bark is very dry you have to do it in straight away, straight away in the field. And field actually allows us to do it. So when working on Pazarek uh, burial mound, we are dealing with items of the uh, next items. So, so these are the main stages of the work. So when during the field conservation students worked with us of mountain altai state university they have decided to try their attempts in restoration many of them went and continuing as a restorer svetlana yurina assisted us a lot so when we had the also like a field school of conservation of archaeological organic findings so this is the other aspect that was Kazil Balchok and at the Pazarek burial mound in parallel of the fifth Pazarek burial mound so it's wet birch bark in torn birch bark items and it's tied for the part of the house and we studied each one of those pieces and it was important to maintain and to restore those fragments that had technical peculiarities like holes specially made holes very often there were knots fabric knots it's also the wet layer there's clay permafrost 
inside uh, the temperature was around zero degrees Celsius so we take it out and then we do it we don't need to, we just maintain the humidity that it has so while it is uh, wet we work with it and finalize our restoration that's it thank you so much for the attention any questions if any thank you Okay, and the next report is Evgenia Belkevich, restoration of fragments of a wooden saddle of the 6th century with metal decoration elements. Thank you so much. My name is Evgenia Belkevich, and I will provide you the results of the restoration of the wooden saddle of the 6th century with decoration from metal. And I would like to know that this is not just my work, but Olga Lazari was dealing with wood, but I'm the one reporting because Olga has another uh, report related to the birch bark. So I'll present uh, the results of our joint work here today for you. In 2009, the, out of the expedition, there were fragments of the wooden saddle. It's coming from the burial of the Baksansky district of kabardino balkaria Republic. The excavation was done in 2019 of the historical museum of the kabardino balkaria State Historical Museum, headed by the scientific staff of the historical monuments Anna Arkadieva. The burial is located at the high skill where two rivers are joined. The necropolis is placed 1,000 meters above the sea level. The burial, the burial 177 from the saddle is related to the Alan era and it's the 6th century AD so it was disturbed but it was it was disturbed but it was not uh, nothing was stolen from it so we were able to find the saddle at the entry to this burial chamber here on the left you can see the place where we found it but during the clearing the process, the archaeologists made the decision that they will maintain the link of the entry. But then the fragment have fallen down onto the fragments of to the saddle. So and on the next, there are pictures how they came to us. So it's clear that the slab which was under this link and why this link was maintained, it was full of the uh, bow and saddle were at the entry chamber on one side and in the center of the burial chamber. You can see it on the right. There were fragments of a base of the saddle, but they were hardly recognizable. And the author of the uh, excavations has said that this split was not the result of stealing from it because uh, the slab was not distracted, but it was done they were split during the the burial tradition. So the bones and on the belt on the legs they were with the incrustation of the red glass. All of those artifacts are in the restoration.
So the fragments of the saddle came as the loads of uh, metal and wooden objects taken from the dry soil. They were placed on the standard craft and they were packaged in the paper. So they were excavated as being dry by such patch packaging allowed us to reach to reach the atmosphere level of dryness. So the wood is degraded, there are cracks, contaminations. You also have the metal parts of the foil, clips, which is a part of this object. They were covered with soil, matters of corrosion of copper and gold. And you can see the silver foil on top of it, uh, with, uh, plated with gold. First we need to take out everything from the soil and dirt. So we were in, so we're using brushes, and then we take out all, all of the parts of the saddle. We have taken even the smallest fragments of the details of the cover, clubs, needles, and small fragments of foil. In the top right you can see the largest fragment of foil. How it was taken out of the soil. Also, when taking the wood out of it, we have found a fragment, a strip of a fine leather length by six centimeters by nine millimeters. And on the sides there were losses, dark brown leather. We, had, we did the mechanical purification with a stereo microscope with brushes and uh, surgeon's knife. So uh, the work was done by the artist restorator Natalia Salamatina in the art, show, uh, art shops of our uh, museum. There were a number of punctures in two lines, but the, uh, but the lines were absent. So, wooden parts of the saddle with metal. So, when we extracted it, that's how it looked. Well, sorry. So, I missed one page here. So, working with the fragments of wood, we split it into two into two parts. So when there's uh, not much metal, so the work was uh, first done to strengthen the wood and to pure, to clear everything. Up. So after we have strengthened the wood, we were strengthening the metal decorations on it. And uh, here we've seen the strengthening of the wood. And then the metal was strengthened, and now the largest fragment of the segment clearing was done down to the metal before strengthening the wooden bases of it in small parts, like one square centimeter, which were with four to five percent of proloid B72 in ethyl acetate. This solvent was used. Um, uh, for the fact that it is evaporates very rapidly and strengthens uh, only the top layer, uh, but it's not going down into the wood, so we can clear the wood. Then bit by bit, we cleared everything, and it allowed us to remove the uh, residues of corrosion of um, copper and uh, silver. But due to the fact that in bronze, like claps and needles, so the metal core of it was, was not maintained, 
because it have led to the losses of the part of the details and the fragments of the foils. They were showing the ornaments or they were um, concealing the ornaments. And even if we remove it, we will, you know, the check the foils. So only there, when it was not sticking to the corrosion, we were able to clear it off and find the ornament on the foil. So when we started clearing it, we um, have decided not to go with chemical cleaning of the metal. Well, it's quite clear because that the, the, the chemical compounds, it would be impossible to remove them. After strengthening the wood and all the fragments we have cleared as, uh, of the decorative uh, metal slates and uh, foil and then installation of it back when it was possible, installing it back onto the wood. So we done we used with the surgical tools and the wooden sticks, sharp wooden sticks. We did it with a microscope. After that the selection and uh, gluing together of the fragments was performed and on the slide there's a fragment of the foil when it's all crumbled and then after it's there. So and it found its place on a big fragment as a result. As part of the mechanical coherence and strengthening, we have received, uh, received nine, nine, two, 12 items out of wood with some decoration remaining onto it. And as a result, we have received two big objects. For gluing together, we use 20% paraloid glue on the boot on the spirit. We used the brushes and then sticking mechanically or sitting under the weight until the, the glue becomes solid. As the result of the works conducted, we were able to assemble two big 16 by 7 and a half and two well by 5. So it's the front, front part of the saddle. The first, the largest one, is movement in the form of the detail of the front of the saddle. On the side of it, out of the perimeter, there is a stripe with threads and needles which are, and with which the foil is attached to the saddle. And we now can see the picture that is clearly seen on the technical. So this is an ornament, it has a fish skin pattern, and the round ornament is stamped but with a continuous line. Next to the bronze line, there's a thin, fine ornament form of the lines. It is at the bottom. Bottom left corner, you can see a different ornament. The bronze film, the bronze stripe, the bronze stripe uh, of the width of four millimeters, it has an inbent form in the center. The second fragment is a symmetrical repeatedness of the first one, but here we were able to clear and find the round, round shape of it. Well, you can see it in the top, in the central part. You can clearly see. So needles, well, nails, nails with the uh, middle they put into the line and they connect with each other 
forming a decorative element. It's interesting to note the paired, uh, paired holes on both sides of the aspect, which is how it was fastened to the bases of the saddle. The distance between those metal pins is the same as between the holes on the wooden fragments, which we can propose on the basis of that. But these are two parts making one with this connection. It's difficult to see in the structure of the whole of the saddle. However, it's clear that this is a part of the hard saddle, frontal part of the hard saddle, which was a regular saddle for nomads of that time who resided from southeast of, Vol of uh, Caucasus and um, Volga River down to Europe. And I have found that the majority of works it says about on the metal plates, residues on the metal uh, of the wooden residues of the wood. So the fragments, the wood makes our very valuable for the examiners and researchers. The fact that in this case it's not only metal, it's the wood that was preserved. And to conclude, I would like to work on working with the saddle we have taken, testing on the, the coating, unfortunately chemical, technological, have shown, uh, the, no lacquers have shown uh, on the and on the basis of the visual examination, we did the there's also uh, that it is of a nut tree, a wood. And the ones that were not conserved it will be given to the lab for examination on the nature of the type of tree. And we also need to do research to understand the um, purpose of the leather belts and where our belt would go. Is it, was it just on the side or a cover or just the decoration or it is a constructive element or fastening? So when clearing, clearing the fragments we were trying to identify the decor with RFA med expert. We have the preliminary character of the results because this apparatus identifies the presence of certain elements in the alloy and to clarify the percentage of the metals we need to deliver further analysis on a more precise apparatus. Also the silver foil, um, it's impossible to say how the gold was attached to it, with which method. And we'll also clarify on the technology of putting ornament onto the foil. Consequently, all of the information acquired in the process of restoration and at later stages on the materials and technologies of the production will be used in the future to create graphical reconstruction of the saddle when uh, providing the publications of the burial mound of Zavukova 3. Yep, thank you. A great sample that very thorough jeweler type like work allows us to have such things and assist, assists us in studying the peculiarities and I was looking at it you know you're afraid but you, you're still doing you're a jeweler type work and in terms of so those saddles that go to Altai, they are made out of uh, birch, birch. And it's, uh, it was a nut tree. But it was, it was a small vessel. It was interesting. Interesting. Why it was not a birch? From a regular birch. But the nut and the and the color. So logically, we can say that hmm. 
Yes. Thank you so much. I'm very glad that we continue with nomadic culture. It's really great, really great. And the next port is Olga Lazareva, restorer of the first category of the restoration department of the reserve collection of the State Historical Museum from Moscow. She's going to tell us on the conservation and storage of the archaeological ma objects made of birch bark. Well, good afternoon, everyone. The restoration workshop of the State Historical Museum got three items from archaeological birch bark, birch bark, and different in age. The first item was called birch bark found in 1937 in the village of Galeat in the Republic of Southern Ossetia, Alania. It came in dry as miscellaneous fragments dating back to the 13th century. The second one is called Kolchan. It dates back to between 2015 uh, 13,080 it was dug up in 2015 uh, in the village of Remont in the Rostov region. It came in partially fragmented. The top part was assembled, the lower part uh, as uh, fragments. It was dry. The material was uh, dry. And the third item is uh, two years uh, made of uh, wood and uh, birch bark dug up in 2018 by the Gnezdovsky archaeological site dating back to the 9th or 11th century the birch bark is intact there is a wooden uh, substrate also the ecological birch bark loses its chemical physiological uh, properties to analogical modern materials even as compared to items uh, made in 200 100 years ago it becomes more fragile prone to deformations and cracks. Its hydro-isolating uh, properties go down. It can either accumulate or lose uh, moisture quickly. It's uh, uh, prone to oxidation and rotting of organic material, corrosion of metal, salts of the soil, and biological uh, processes. Um, also, the painting is affected, so birch bark samples uh, lose their um, color they are bleached. It's not only the, the long period exposure to the soil, but the chemical properties of the soil in this site. The storage conditions are also important. When exposed to the air, birch bark, even kept in relatively dry soil, loses its moisture, which damages it. When it uh, it dries up uncontrollably, it loses its shape and it it destroys itself. So you have to restore them once you extract them, which is very important to keep them from over drying and further destroying themselves. And they need a universal package to be transported to the place of restoration and storage when being restored. The Restoration Council has to determine the steps for preservation to make birch bark stable for uh, d display or for uh, storage. Um, the first two items had to be cleaned, preserved, and assembled. And the third one, and the third one had to be cleaned, uh, restoration treated, and dried. Uh, the, the first item, first we studied it under a microscope and we took samples of dark color, which we thought was the inner layer. We did it by IR spectrometry, which showed that it included a uh, emir growing oil from African trees from the Brasurva family of trees. 
then we um, preliminarily assembled this item and it, we saw one big site and three smaller sites. Then, after cleaning, we deleted, uh, we removed uh, dirt deposits inside and outside by a PEG solution 1500, removed it effectively without uh, touching the surface of the item. It also uh, worked as a classifier. Every fragment was cleaned uh, with a slow drying. Each cleaned fragment was covered by a polyethylene film and put under a glass for two days to keep them from quickly drying and deforming. Once all the parts were cleaned, we put them together clean, so to say, finally. And uh, on the inside, each fragment is connected by a thin layer of pepper, tobacco paper, 1% of acyl cellulose solution. It was uh, along the lines of the fibers that the direction was then. The paper had a drawing of the reconstruction of the sh supposed shape of the item. To look at it uh, uh, around the contour and the diagram outside and inside, we cut out the uh, forms of the item. There was no fixation in there. I want to uh, uh, stress it, uh, no fixation on neither, on either side, because there is, you can see, a clear ornament there on the birch bark. It was pressed by glass on both sides, using firmoplast film. On the edges there were process holes for air circulation, and this uh, structure is used for storage, and so one can look at it, at this item, from both sides. The second one is its birch bark and uh, bone parts came in fragmented partially dry arrow case there was uh, some mold lots of deformation some peeling also of uh, birch bark metal of corrosion and uh, soil inclusions it came in without uh, bone liners uh, when we were working with it uh, the main job was uh, to preserve and to reinforce the material to get rid of the deformations and to clean the surface uh, dirt and uh, inclusions and to restore the shape of the item. First we removed the upper part of the item which was well preserved or better preserved than the other parts. So these are all the fragments uh, so I kind of put them in this order and some in the lower part. Uh, working with each uh, fragment, uh, we were working with it individually and you had to work with each and every one of them. Some of them I cleaned. The two middle layers uh, were disconnected by me, but I did it delicately, gently. Some of them had to have their deformations removed and uh, I did it by compression, so I applied compression and then using small bags with sand or some clamps, we, I went step by step. It, it, it was very fragile, the material, so you had to be gentle about it. Here you can see how it was being glued together, how we were dealing with the deformations. There are so many of them. Once we were finished with all the works, we started putting the item together. together. To simplify that, I went layer by layer. I made a drawing of each layer, this is what I mean, and uh, I put all the fragments there, I selected them by color, by structure, and uh, there were also traces uh, traces of uh, the original craftsman tools, 
that they used to put it together and it started uh, to all fall into place to piece together but we're still going to keep working with it because we wanted to be one whole thing like and now we're preserving the bone liners. Once we get the liners back or the bone parts back, we will see a better picture of it in terms of its length because the length is something that we doubt. The actual length we're not sure of, and the picture from the digging site doesn't paint a good picture of the length. So uh, I assumed it based on the length of our other arrow cases or from that time they were usually 65 to 70 centimeters long and uh, the third item is this it came in wet and like I said before the main job was to clean it for to Pre do preservation in progression and to dry it up we did it in distilled water cleaned uh, there were some dirt inclusions but it didn't take much effort to get rid of them we did it another tricky thing here is that there was a layer of wood under it flat about one centimeter thick so we decided to do its uh, separately, we, we disassembled it um, easily, it uh, kind of came apart easily. So we cleaned it. This is the outer part, the front part, and this is the opposite part. Then, then we used the peg solution to impregnate uh, the birch bark and we uh, decided to take a uh, we couldn't take a sample of it to understand how much peg we needed so I decided to wing it uh, into it it weighed uh, 580 grams at the time so I decided to go with one third of it and by the time it had been cleaned it was 192 grams of peg I kind of distributed it across solutions of 5, 10 and 15 percent and I used spraying for um, impregnation. Uh, the solution basically, uh, sorry, the item was uh, put under a film uh, with compression on both sides and uh, I kept using spraying to increase uh, the concentration of uh, the spray until all of the spray was gone, had been used up, and the birch bark was uh, dried up in soft conditions under a cellophane uh, film to prevent possible deformation. There was a layer of sand, and on top of it, I decided to put well there is under the layer of sand there was a uh, soft substrate not to lose the form, the shape and once it was almost dry the cracks uh, introduced uh, a 1% solution of methyl cellulase and with 1% of PEG uh, 1500 and this is how we were trying it up. There were some holes for moisture to go out, and this is what it looked like once dried up. And then we manufactured a structure to keep it, to store it. It was placed on a wooden substrate and a soft one too, since it was made of two layers, one layer of wood, but the wood was uh, basically uh, manufactured using the same logic. So on a, we, on a flat wooden substrate, uh, a soft cushion or pillow was put one centimeter thick with sand in it and on top of it 
our the birch bark was laying and on top of the birch bark there was a pillow full of sand because unfortunately everything that's flat kind of becomes round over time and the main idea behind my work here was to use uh, basically similar identical materials but by different methods uh, in many different various cases thank you very much for your attention Olga Alexandrovna demonstrated another feat of restoration so she was working attentively and meticulously with these little tiny items and Olga Alexandrovna independently uh, echoes my report because of the culture that I was talking about can be a direct analogy of your uh, item because I think it came it was basically similar ours was more diagonal I think we should share the information that we have so we can learn and your individual approach that you showed uh, uh, deserves admiration to the item and uh, to the surface so that your your attention was meticulous we'll be waiting for more publications from you and uh, more cooperation with you the next report is uh, <coughs> features of gender historic analysis of poorly preserved archaeological wood Zakhar Yurjankov, candidate of historical sciences, leading researcher, Department of General History, Laboratory of Natural Science Methods in Archaeology and History, Siberian Federal University. Polina Ishutsana and Aliona Barishnikov are his co authors. You can hear me okay, right? Yes, I'm online. I do hope that you can. You... That's it. We can see you. Great, great. Zakhar, please start. We're very glad to hear you. So, welcome, dear you, to this conference, dear colleagues. Just a second, I will launch my presentation. Can you see me now? No? There's a screen dim or something. Please, uh, don't be in a hurry. We'll, we'll wait for you a little bit. So do it full screen, please. Okay, it's looking good now. So I'll do my best to fix it now. We can see the presentation, yeah. But unfortunately, my screen demonstration have froze. We can see your presentation, but it's not moving. Nothing is happening. Just a second, I will try to launch once again. We can see you, but we do not see your screen. No, yes, now we see the presentation.
У меня все листает, но почему-то я не вижу. Ой, давайте тогда, может, давайте надо попозже. Да, да, да. Окей, then uh, you'll be next, af uh, next after Mr. Karpukhin. So, we so methodological aspects of identifying the sources of wood origin and dendrological studies. Mr. Alexey Karpukhin, researcher of the Institute of Archaeology, Russian Academy of Sciences from Moscow. Um, and we'll be coming back to Mr. Zahar after the presentation by Mr. Karpukhin. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. I'd like to continue of the dendrochronology topic. Well, it does. My report it does not have the direct relation to uh, the new results. However, in the foreign specialized scientific papers in the recent years we have received a large amount of works in the den dendro provenancio so so i can say about the origin or the sources sources of wood so the story on the sources of wood in the archaeological studies for the first time, it was touched in 1960s due to the studies of the wooden bases of the wooden panels of the Dutch and English um, artists with the attraction of other materials such as wooden sculpture, furniture, musical instruments, elements of architecture, etc. It allowed us up to current date to identify and reason the idea on the big imports of wood and forestry uh, to UK and to the Dutch areas from the Baltic states territory. So then the methodological approaches were formed which are united by the understanding as uh, dendro provenancing of Baltic timber and then it was uh, also used for the materials of the sunk ships and geography have expanded their works on the materials coming from the Mediterranean, Northern America and even New Zealand. And the most important as of today, the most full covering story of this problematic, it was published in the works of Martin Bridging, or Martin Bridges, co-authored with Anthony M. Fowler. Well, the problems of finding the sources of wood at this stage it's not developed not being developed the only work of the Russian scientist joined with the Polish colleagues is the source of finding the sources of wood from the uh, locations of Svalbard samples chronologies from the mainland so that is when we study the collections of the archaeological monuments that are located on the territory of our land. And this issue was touched when working with materials from Malgazia, Nadem town, and located in the Tundra area that has a deficiency of wood there by nature well, for the construction. The researchers came up with the opinion that the wood from the disassembled ships was used and also the floating logs that were carried for by the sea from the archaeological monuments from the forest zone it's not attributable to it however um, there is a stereotype that widely used the local sources of wood were used one of the bright 
an extravagant example is the story of this uh, fortress of Sviersk. And as we know, that uh, it was assembled in one place and then it was disassembled and then transferred to Sviersk. This is a separate interesting uh, source finding story that was not disclosed, but what we are able to see and find is the other interesting aspect that related to the history of Belazersk monastery. The story of the source of the wood, it's not applicable to this territory because it is very rich with forest. Belazersk monastery is one of the largest landowners over there and uh, must have a lot of forest available. However, the researchers by the source um, researcher of the monastery, he have mentioned um, and, and it was of the order of um, providing uh, the forest to the to Poshekhonia to Ivanov Bor here it's provided on the map and it is clear that there is a certain peculiarities here in place and there is also a point of surrounding it here which I mentioned here however please Look at the Pashakonia from monastery, more than 150 kilometers, plus Sheksna River is flowing from north to south. So if we are planning any delivery by water, then the delivery will be done upstream. Because we don't know the details, how this the Pashakonia is surrounding, from where the forest was coming from. Plus. Nikolsky have published and the operation of the forest and the memory of the forest work was published in 1969 where in full detail it is disclosed the order of cutting of the forest to whom it was allowed and to whom it was not allowed. Very specific is the issue related to changes of the sources of wood within the chronological retrospective. The materials of the Great Novgorod, we will study them currently, uh, that we are currently studying, and they confirm uh, the significant amendments in the development of Nizhny Novgorod and the organization of city construction, which have happened in the middle of 13th century. In this period, those uh, big qualitative changes were delivered and systematic coming of high quality construction wood coming to the town. So by summing up, I'd like to sum up by saying that for the medieval age, due to different um, due to different reasons of the relations that were there and the uneven schematics of the organization of construction, the scheme of provision with wood of the large cities and towns of that time would have a more complex character than we believe it is in the first place. So, as an example, I would like to demonstrate how we can call this method as a dendro provenance method, how it works. Well, being brief, there is a certain starting point on the left slide in, say, in Turkey, triangle in the center and for the, for the territory of UK and there is a point on the right part or the red point on the right part of the slide so we have a measure of the yearly um, rings and we start to compare it with geographically developed network of the chronology and depending on the indicators of the criteria so, the amount of, the, the dimension of uh, the, those points, the, the bigger the points, the, the more similar it is. So, it's like a group of dots, and it relates to such items as so the wood from the sunken ships, uh, plus 
this direction, we got interested in it. But without any material, because we never worked with the um, ship, uh, shipping wood, wood of, of, of the ships. So we have decided how this whole thing works. On the previous slide, this is a classic model that was used for many years, depending on the parameters. On, on, onto the parameters, we searched similar characteristics in terms of chronology. However, in 2020, the first work have appeared of a similar author on the materials from New Zealand and on the territory of UK. We have noted that when comparing these two character these characteristics, not these are not ships. This is the chronology of the historical buildings. And he proposed to amend the method by using the comparison of the residue, residual chronology. So on the left slide, this is the comparison of them on the regular chronology. And on the top right, this is indexed chronography. So mathematically treated rows and the bottom slides are the residual chronologies. On the residual chronologies, you can understand the following. So when, for all the compared chronologies, we create an average chronology, and then on the basis of that, it is subtracted from each particular one. And then the, re the residue, they propose to compare it. So we have decided how to, to establish how it works. So these are um, chronologies of, uh, of the wooden chronologies on the modern on the modern wood from the data bank, the northern one is PDB, it's not on the bank, it's on the modern forest in Solovki, uh, acquired by the Institute of Geography of Russian Academy of Sciences. So we try to have a look and compare it in, in that way. Okay. So, 13 chronologies on architectural monuments of Arkhangelsk region. So, so, from 2 up to 26, plus on the modern wood and on the rules of the data bank, it's at least 10 samples or even more. So, we tried to compare uh, using this idea of the chronologies uh, to compare them with each other. We tried to do it with six statistical uh, coefficients. I will not go down into deep detail because it's well described in the literature. Not everybody is uh, using it one or two, depending on the lab, of course. However, what we have acquired here, out of 13 of, well, 28 monuments, we have received 127 combinations for each index. I will clarify on the numbers here. If we will go and enter the central chronology and find the... It is clear that the earliest it cannot be compared to the upper part because it's more early and it's, the length of it is not enough. So consequently, it will be compared to one or two. So as a result, we have received the press selections uh, of uh, those comparisons and we are trying to find how the coefficients behave within this volume. So this is the diagram. You see, so the further 
from the source of wood of this chronology it so in four out of six we can find the dependency at least we can see the trend here a weak trend of course but the general trend is that the, the larger the distance uh, the more different it is on the other ones there are no on the other two coefficients there is no dependency same we try to do it for dependency depending on the interval of coverage so how the chronologies are lapped overlapped on each other and in the similar works of the foreign authors related to the transfer to the well index chronologies that the t value is, is not quite correct because it is dependent on the length of the comparison of the rows rows um, here we get a different picture as well because there is a dependency on three coefficients so the longer is the chronology then the higher the grade of comparison but on other three we do not see this picture trying to implement it onto the maps so we have taken the chronologies on the on the um, and 10 chronologies of the Mudyug Burial, and that is the picture that we have received. It's clear, then we need to look at it in more detail. But depending on the coefficient, this picture will differ a little bit. So we tried to go further and look at it. Here's the average chronology, and then there is a residual chronology. See the pictures, they are quite different. But on the other ones, it's not, not always that it matches. And I would like to finish by saying that the results from our methodological exercises allow us to say that if we see the works in terms of dendro provenancing, we need to treat the results with great care because a big role will be played by the um, method of initial treatment. It's either raw measurements or the uh, arithmetically transformed, then which of the coefficient shall be used? And the main problem for Russia is the absence of the wide geographical network of chronologies related to specific chronological intervals. And you have noted also that evaluations based there, they cannot be confirmed in terms of using the evaluating coefficients or the matters of reorganization of the rows. Here I would like to wind up very important outcome. I like to say thank you so much. Big work, big work that you have delivered. Should you have any questions? Okay, then we'll leave it open for the discussion. Yes, thank you. Oh, yeah, there is a question, right? Unfortunately, uh, the speaker is not using the microphone. So, so in Karelia, how would you utilize the dendrochronological tool? How would you use it? I can say at the level of feelings, but not arguments. It can be similar to anything. That will be a puzzle when we compare with the whole masses of the data and we look where it will come play, better or worse. 
we'll double check regularly in those situations if we search for the samples we don't have anything we just ask what time what time are we talking about then we look what is the data set for that time geographically that we have and then we just selection by selection we go and it it will hit and then we get the dating when we compare and sometimes it's happened you know we go through the massive and we don't have the there's, there's, there's no comparison really and consequently we cannot state the time so we'll try to connect Krasnoyarsk once again hello hello once again you can hear me okay right and you can see me great so yeah now everything is moving yeah just put it onto the full screen I just see my presentation here no nothing is moving again We can see the presentation, but it is not moving anywhere, so we'll... Just leave it... It's okay. Leave it like that, then. Then we, we can see it. Okay, let's just start. The peculiarities of... Features of dendritic historic analysis of poorly preserved archaeological wood in the condition of the sandy soils of Krasnaya are sky will try to deliver. And quite a bit, well, I'm a nomad in comparison to you. And I'm just. Well, as of today, as you can see, this is the geography of our work and what was done. We are attributing dates to the cultural heritage and I would like to say that the problem that we face is dating of the brothers of the Brotherhood Fortress which is located in Kolomensky in Moscow. We dated it the tower that was in Angarsk and it didn't match the historical one. A huge amount of letters were wrote to Moscow but unfortunately we didn't get any permits on working with the Kolomensk of compare it with the Kolomensk tower. But we try to deliver certain works on dating of the ship, ships and vessels would and that is the wood from the island of uh, Dixon and on the right is from Mangazia. 18th century and one of the main works is dating of the archaeological residues of buildings from Lukinsky Astrog, etc. And we move now to the topic of this work. This is the research of the archaeological residue wood in the Krasnoyarsk. The place is noted here. So the historical center of the city where the fortress was placed. And when doing the excavations in the fortress, the wood was found, but it was not preserved. In Krasnoyarsk, well, the wood is in, is in the bad condition for dendro chronological analysis. I'm just providing you with the first experience of this work. As up to today, we didn't do it. So we found the habitat, habitat number four. So this is just one side. So these are the main materials that we were able to take the wood from there. That's how they looked in situ. That's how we have taken the probes. 
and then we did the cameral processing. It was conducted because they were particularly burned samples and they were crackled, they were very crackled. So we tried to glue it together with film 10 or even more times while drying. Because impregnating with the chemical agents, it will not allow us. And it's difficult, it's long. And to have the good looks of the annual rings, it's difficult, yellow rings, it's difficult. So we would go very deep into the, uh, the glue, gluing pistol in order to polish it without the saw or by hand to get a good cross section it is impossible so then we have received the digital imaging of it with the yearly rings and we use the X Epson Pro scanner and the Epson Perfection Pro and Q recorder and the graphical image in the CD dendro so that's the sides cross sections you can see it the burnt parts you can see of it so the, the, the preservation was very bad we use the microscope with a motorized table that allows us to get the image of very uh, to get the image of very high quality particularly it's important for very narrow rings which is a real savior in this situation so the collection of ashes we were able to digitalize it to measure it and to create a number of interesting floating parts to it another example on how it works and how the digital would look like then we use the chronology that were dated in before in Yeniseis, Krasnoyarsk and Achinsk we have found that there is a joint signal over there and as of today for Krasnoyarsk there is no long lasting chronology but there is a common signal on a big territory of up to 300 kilometers then there was um, of individual series cross dating was performed a big coefficient of correlation on the right we could observe the calendar on Yeniseisk with Achinsk and with Krasnoyarsk the correlation is quite good about 0 0.5 and we have acquired the dating of this object 1766 despite the fact that the wood was of a bad quality for calendar dating and to conclude I would like to say that in year 2022 we have acquired all of the samples archaeologists from the center of Krasnoyarsk. Uh, they were partially burned, so the multi-stage cameral treatment, polishing with 120, 320, 600, 1,000 grain, and as a result, and uh, then the dating with this method was done for Krasnoyarsk. An important aspect here is that in the perspective we can find the residues of the Krasnoyarsk fortress and it will allow us in the future to get the date of the Krasnoyarsk fortress. An important thing here. There we have a <coughs> big, well, well-recognized signal for such a large 
territory, which is quite interesting. Zachar, thank you so much. Uh, thanks for sharing. And we wish you luck in your future studies. So we move to the next presenter, another online participant, Vilana uh, Valentina Stepanovna. Research of archaeological wood with the anatomical method in the State Hermitage Museum, delivered by Anna Stepanova, candidate of biological sciences, leading researcher of Department of Scientific and Technical Expertise of the State Hermitage Museum from the city of St. Petersburg. Well, I think we're getting there. <laughs> Okay, I think I figured it out. Dear colleagues, good afternoon. My job will be a difficult one because I will be telling you about a subject that you know more than me. I've been working for the Komarov University my whole life without any relation to archaeology and for the last two years I've been working for the state art. However, in 2020 when uh, we were all in lockdown, I was looking through the recordings of Maria Ivanovna Kolosova, who was uh, a very lazy laptop user and uh, so I decided to analyze her paper works and uh, these works, these papers were very diverse. It was very impressive. I'll be telling you about that. Marie Ivanovna was called in, sorry, born in 1932. Her mother was a school teacher, her father uh, a professor at the uh, Forest Technical Academy, which she graduated from. Tatiana Dubaga was where she got her diploma from, a well-known expert in gardening art. However, when Maria Ivanovna graduated, the faculty closed down because of political reasons. After that, Maria Ivanovna Sorry, your slides, uh, your slides are not scrolling. Oh yes, so yes, we're in the second slide. Uh, this is uh, okay. I won't uh, open them then. I'll be showing them like that. When she was a postgraduate student, she was working with Andrei Yatsenko Kamilevsky, who just had just come to Leningrad from Belisi. He was a well known a researcher in the anatomy of wood and uh, they told me that he was always scouting for talented uh, students and he had that opportunity. He dealt with different aspects of wood including identification of archaeological wood. He identified uh, wood from the diggings of the Urarpar, which was headed by Mr. Babarovsky. Boris Babarovsky. Okay. I need to digress here to tell you what anatom the anatomical method of wood research is. If you look at a piece of wood, and I marked, painted uh, some of these structural elements with different colors, four, there are four elements uh, like that to wood, each of the types having its own structural integrity properties and features of uh, orientation to each other, the holes on the walls, how they are located, their locations, the front walls, whether there are any small 
bridges and bridge like elements inside and beam like elements and we get like uh, dozens of a uh, of uh, features like that and they're usually within this we have a series of features that whose combination would be unique for the origin of that particular tree in sp tree species uh, so we can identify a lot of things based on st tree species usually it's three sections uh, made on a piece of wood if we're talking about uh, ordinary wood and they use these method of anatomical research for that kind of analysis and a 3d model is built and then described Oh, Marie Ivanovna, when a postgraduate student, was uh, dealing with issues of uh, the kind of archaeological wood, uh, and her thesis was very diverse. She looked into the evolutional uh, consistencies uh, for over 1,500 species, and basically her work uh, confirmed uh, the belief uh, that wood could be functionally applied to many types of materials. Once she graduated with line flowers, she color, she started working uh, for the academy for in tropical, uh, ex sorry, exotic types of wood because of this surge of export from countries like Vietnam. Over 53 species she laid out in her works with anatomical species identified commentaries and technical properties of wood laid out. And these works are still important today as they were when they came out. Marie Ivanovna started cooperating with the State Hermitage in 1965. In 1974, they issued a joint paper on uh, the preservation of wet uh, archaeological wood where she described a poorly carpophlactan method of conservation and she used the microscope Connellus not only for wood species identification but also for identification and preservation and preservation treatments and this is a differential study of tree sp wood species uh, showed that its uh, treatments can be good for pines uh, but can be uh, can cause cracks in others and uh, the structural properties of wood or arche wet archaeological wood and their freezing with preliminary impregnation of polyethylene glycolin was another paper she did it together with the Novgorod Museum team and the work showed that the optimal measurement of the state of damage would be the maximum density evaluation when you're choosing the conservation method you should um, keep in mind uh, the tree uh, the wood species and you should use uh, the analysis to understand why uh, different species have their setting and uh, how they try in what way they try. In 1985, Maria Ivanovna issued the anatomical analysis of wet uh, archaeological wood, uh, where she unexpectedly concluded that it is easily broken by fibrous elements and then by springs, uh, beams. And the, uh, the better the beams, the better, the more integral the wood is. And all it comes down to the species of the wood. By wrapping up, I would like to mention the Pskovsky uh, uh, leather musical instruments that were preserved, reconstructed. We call them gutki. But this major job started from identifying the species of wood. Most of the time, Maria spent in the State Hermitage identifying the 
pieces for an endless series of samples. She rarely co-authored papers, but the number of papers which she was thanked for her analysis is very vast. It's so big. For 25 years, well, while she was in business, she identified uh, the species of over 7,000 species for 1,000 uh, and uh, for 5,600 of which were archaeological wood, which uh, goes back, dates back to the Stone Age, to the ethnographical time from uh, northern east western Russia to Buryatia, to the Republic of Buryatia. This is how the geography of her work. These numbers are astounding to me at least, because the microscopical structure of archaeological wood uh, is very, is considerably changed, and uh, identifying it and examining it takes a lot of skill and knowledge. And one report, of course, wouldn't fit all everything I want to tell you. I will just give you a few examples showing the different aspects of using the anatomical analysis of wood in archaeology. A research by Maria Ivanovna she was uh, CRTU2 where she was identifying species not, uh, not only in the inventory of wood, so inventory or china uh, dug up, but also of pilings, uh, and we used the, the gender chronological analysis method here, and we built gender chronological scales for each species. Another productive cooperation was that of Marivanovna in the Institute of Material Culture, which led to the publishing of many papers, including the analysis of the vast body, body of materials, uh, papers, and uh, they show that instruments were chosen based on the physical and mechanical properties of wood uh, back uh, in the ancient times. The Vikrov and Kolchin were the first to arrive at this in 1961 when they were studying Novgorod findings, but Marie Ivanovna confirmed it for the Middle Age Ladoga for the nomadic. Uh, st and Stone Age uh, settlements. A few other examples of uh, studies that Maria analyzed wood for. It's uh, combs, skiffs, combs, and skiff china. A uh, card like this from the from a Korgan for Vital Mount, a polysander made fragment that can be easily identified by its regular structure on the con congenital section. And this finding confirmed that it came from China. Yenisei mask of the Tashtik culture, they were armed or filled with plant materials. When analyzed, these materials uh, proved to have wood and uh, willow wood, and they were reinforced by thin twigs. A, an Egyptian sarcophag that many researchers studied and restored in 2004. This paper came out in 2004. It was a about the musification of sarcophags, attribution and uh, preservation. And as for the plants, it's not only wood that was studied, like Ficus simicarus and Tamaric species, but it was also the plant inside, the plant contents of the coatings, and based on the remnants of epidermis, 
I like the tissue of plants, so this thin uh, outer layer uh, showed that, that it is wheat and they, for scalping they used wheat, uh, this manure of a chewing animal fed uh, wheat. I would like to wrap up today by citing Maria Ivanovna herself. The first thesis was in modern archaeology, it's mandatory to do anatomical research of wooden items to determine its taxonomical origin. I think this is what actually she uh, paved the way for. And uh, on this note, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Anna Valentinovna, for your speech. Maria Ivanovna contributed greatly to studies of archaeological materials that became or served as uh, the basis for the reconstruction of ancient landscape and uh, cultural links and ancient technologies. Maria was also worked also not only with archaeological exhibits but with uh, historical items that were complex, uh, hard to determine most of the time. She was a very kind person, responsive person. She was uh, passionate about her job, always willing to share advice, to give advice. advice. She was uh, a real go-getter when it came to her job. And she was a very sincere person too. We miss her a lot. And she also did a lot of, uh, she contributed greatly to many other institutes and museums across Russia, apart from the state hermitage, of course. Thank you very much. Uh, and, and since there are no questions, oh, do you want a break or what? Should we keep going? Then we will continue and the next report by Lydia Solovyova, Junior Researcher, Laboratory of Natural Science Methods, the Institute of Archaeology, Russian Academy of Sciences, to tell us about the method for identification of the types of archaeological wood and coal by anatomical features. <coughs> Well, uh, our reports echo each other, so I'll be citing and referencing Anna Valentinovna in many ways. The reason why I chose this uh, topic was uh, to introduce you to the method of identification of wood by anatomical features, and the previous report showed um, that still, no matter how experienced you are, you get researchers in your lab asking you the same questions. How do we determine this or that? How do we identify that? What do we need for that? What, uh, how big should the piece of wood be? What, what will happen if we cut it off or if we don't cut it off? They keep asking the same questions, so I decided to make a report on how it happens. S basic, basically, in essence, in Russia, Oh, I have just one, this guy. Oh, there is three of them. There is supposed to be three guys, not one. This method was developed uh, in 1935. Uh, the Anatomy of Plants book came out by Leonid Alexandrovich Ivanov, the determiner of uh, wood uh, species by Sukachev and other author authors, 1946. New works kept coming out. This series of work called The Determiner of Woods by Microscopical Features by Gummerman, Nikolaev, and others. And this book describes 97 um, different species, um, um, six pine species with uh, special keys, uh, like with a step by step uh, description of features specific for each. 
uh, type and so like uh, by this you find the necessary plant. In, in the third book, which came out in 1946, many species were determined, uh, were uh, described for the first time, and uh, the, uh, there is a number of microphotos attached and some geographical uh, distribution maps across the USSR, which simplified work, of course, and uh, which paints a better picture, and you know where gro what girls were. In 1950, uh, Vikrov issued the book Diagnostical Features of Wood uh, of the Main uh, Decedents and Pine Works in the USSR with uh, descriptions and an album of photos. Um, for pines and for deciduous species by two different authors. These are the great books and now they should belong on your desk if you are into identifying wood species and these are the under underlying principles of this method. Principle one that the previous speakers speaker has mentioned that the structure of wood is a set of evolutional and uh, inheritable properties that will be common for all representatives of a different species of wood depending on where they grow. The structure of wood within a species is very uniform with next no opportunity to uh, tell between species, especially when we're talking about uh, uh, dug up wood or coal and the anatomical terminology uses a uh, uh, terms uh, developed by the International Association of Wood Anatomists and uh, the terminology recommended by Andrei Yatsenko Kmelevsky. Uh, Well, one more thing uh, that I was looking for, but I can't find it. Anyways, since secondary wood has uh, no uniform structure, it's uh, examined in three mutually perpendicular directions. Like this sample shows, you cut from the front uh, and then you go perpendicular to the rings. This would be radial, and then you go parallel to them, this is the tangential section where you you see the, a picture of how this looks under a microscope the vessels, their location sizes, passages beams, core beams are all different and they are considered common for a species so you have to take into consideration the combination of all features for one specific tree and they're cross-referenced or cross-checked along the way if archaeologic, a piece of archaeological wood can show you how many rows of the core beam there are, you can check it tangentially. All this is uh, taken into account from different points of view, and then it all falls into place. And there are some conclusions. The microscopical features in relation to archaeological wood should not be all relevant. I mean, a restoration specialist should know that sometimes a wood is visually basically hinting you at the principle don't believe your eyes, you have to check it all the time, you have to double check it look at this beautiful pine it's a cross-sectional section from Nizhny uh, sorry, from Novgorod from our archaeological collection it's a ra ra radial section 
It looks very beautiful. <coughs> this is uh, the tangential section. Uh, we have the beam in the middle. We have the beam, and then we can see the passage in the middle also. Uh, Aside from that, all this information that we receive is uh, significant for restoration specialists because based on these pieces of uh, any uh, specific type of wood it's easier for them to choose the right method based on that again uh, when choosing how to preserve that thing or item so I believe it would be great to basically Ident to be able to identify the species of wood uh, at labs. When manufacturing or when making those sections, uh, different approaches are employed. It's all very, it varies a lot. It depends uh, on the state, on the valley in it. It can be just a splice of wood, fragment of wood. It can be some beautiful thing that is not to be touched and it depends on the state uh, of the sample on its condition. Sometimes you have to put them in place in some place or sorry or to just fixate it to get the right section you use paraffin or glycerin gelatin uh, method. I'm drawn to the par to the paraffin one. It's easier this way I think or you can restore it. This is the same plastic coal. Once burned, the structure of wood stays the same. However, it, uh, more, it gets darker and it's more sandy, so it's harder uh, to get in. So some polish, some use glycerin, gelatin methods, uh, and it depends on your situation and what you have on hand. And then you can do basically take your samples as you go, as you proceed and move forward. You have to understand where to go. But <clears throat> it has problems also. The first one is uh, its integrity in the cultural soil. Sometimes it can be lost. Cultural layer, sorry. Uh, so you can you, sometimes you know it's wood, but the structure is gone fully. Nothing to attach, nothing to fasten. In the best ca the best case scenario, you can say it's either deciduous or a pine tree. Rotten samples is because of the um, the, the second reason is that it's, it's through the fault of researchers. They spend too much time thinking, and while they're thinking, it all rots away uh, to the point where you cannot tell what it is. Sometimes pieces are way too small because, well, look at this uh, handworked uh, piece, and you, you can't hold it in your hand, just two millimeters. You can't uh, get any solution for that. So you have to give it back to where you got it. Concerns for the safety of archaeological findings. I've been working in museums for many years, and I've been to museums many years, and uh, uh, museum workers, when they see a razor in your hand over uh, some archaeological finding, they start getting all shaky. Uh, and rightfully so. This is a fragment of a an oak uh, axe before a section was made, and this is the picture after it. The picture is uh, good, I think, but sometimes visually it's hard to determine where the section started because we're talking microscopical level here, and that uh, we have a tangential section here, I believe, before and after. This is the after picture. Integrated in the cultural layer, it's believed that it's in the wet 
layer that uh, wood uh, stays uh, the most preserved, but it's not the case. We get many samples at our lab uh, that were found in the wet uh, layer of uh, dating back to many epochs, and sometimes uh, their state is much better than uh, that of those findings or items from the wet layer. Over 3,000 items have been studied, items of wood, findings, architectural remains, calls from burials and from fires ranging from Ukraine to Germany to Rostov, Oblast to Kaliningrad and others, and the cities with the wet layer account for a lion's share of our findings. And to conclude, I need to say this. Determining wood gives us new opportunities. We we'll get a chance to take a, take a comprehensive look of the item itself and the material in it, and the results can be compared to the results of findings or research uh, through other methods like dendrochronology, polynology, archaeological data. It, it deals with the uh, construction methods, uh, wood. Uh, Construction stats, so the wood they used to build things from back then. It opens up lots of doors for thinking and uh, many questions uh, can be shined a light on here. Some internal links, uh, the species of the trees that uh, were most prevalent during a specific time in the past and why they were chosen over others in Novgorod, by the way. Uh, they did this uh, wide scale research study in the early 50s, uh, late, uh, late 60s, uh, so late 50s, and, less, um, and so they, they examined over 900 wood samples, and the researchers arrived at the conclusion that the wood was chosen for a reason, uh, because um, uh, the species of the wood kind of was in line with the purpose of the item that it was used to build. And um, over time, I think it can be adjusted, these conclusions can be adjusted, because during earlier times uh, in the Novgorod history, in the history of Novgorod, this set of wood species that was used for manufacturing was much wider. It goes back to, it harkens back to the 13th century, but if you look at the 11th or the 12th centuries, uh, it feels like they were using everything. It can be all kind of, it could be all kinds of uh, trees, like apple trees, uh, cherry trees and all that. But the main culture findings, I think, are true. Maybe it's a topic for another day, but just in short, I will, I would like to say that at different, in different parts of Novgorod, the stats related to the use of species to species varies depending on who lived on the site where or state where it was found, where the masters uh, got their wood for building or for craftsmanship. Carpenters uh, drew to pines for carpentry, for carpentry. But on the other end, it was the other way around. So we try to get as much information as we can and make heads and tails of it. Thank you very much, Lydia Nikolaevna. Lydia Nikolaevna, what microscopical method do you use? Is it a scanning microscope or something else? No, we use a passing through light, light passing through. How do you prepare a call? You paraffin? You use paraffin? Which one works for you? 
For the cross section, I use paraffin. Longitudinal section, I use paraffin. Thank you very much. I would like to add that the uh, anatomy of wood will be relevant also because uh, the world of botanics is endless. Uh, we have wood uh, of different kinds in different states. We always find something new. Now we're always looking for new ways of restoration, controlling the existing uh, methods of restoration and uh, basically uh, choosing uh, between methods uh, to tailor them to specific uh, types of wood. Dmitry Kupriyanov, junior researcher at the Institute of Archaeology, Russian Academy of Sciences, about botanical composition of the wood of the handles and scabbards of knives from the Chukutkale burial ground. Dear colleagues, I would like to continue the topic started by the previous uh, speakers and torture with botanical composition. I will be delivering one of my. Uh, I will. Short note, we'll save some time here because I don't want to, you know, cross match with the previous speaker. So, well, why do we need it for? So, the mass and uh, it allows us to get the new information where they produced from the local wood or they were brought from other regions. Was there any special strategy for the selection of the wood, um, f physical and chemical? characteristics uh, was the case or just the wood just by hand it was used we need to use this analysis in line with the other ones with, with the paleontological analysis and the wooden parts of knives and the handles of them and the cases for them that's the most mass findings that we have that we try to analyze handles and cases from uh, Chuhut Kaleh burial ground. And this is just the preliminary report on the preliminary results because the selection is not that wide and there's more to come. So it is located in Crimea in terms of landscape. The Chuhut Kaleh burial ground is related to the currently. We have oak. Major and but and other types of wood are present as well. But next to the, this landscape of uh, bush and forestry areas, forest areas. Plus, I shall say that on the Crimea territory, territory currently in the flora, except of the invasive, such as there. 53 wooden that can be used for the production of the handles of knife. Not even saying that they might be brought there from somewhere. The necropolis of the classical monument, the main category was there was burial grounds and the day, it dates back from the first century of, from the first half of the fifth century up to ninth century. So. That's how the knife handles looked like. And all of the materials that we acquired from the collection of the State Historical Museum, which were acquired on the results of the findings of 1959 up to 1962. That's how they look in the storage. The mechanical selection was done. Uh, the minimum from three to five millimeters the particles of metal on the handles were there and the keepers were there to take off a little bit more of the wood the similar method was used as was said in three projections from 50 up to 200 magnification it was used reflected light and free-flowing light so I came and the most simple method to identify the soil charcoal is to look at it in the reflected light. 
where you don't need to prepare the samples. You just need to crack them, and if they're hard enough, that's it. And for the dark wood, the reflected light is quite suitable for work as well. The passing by light was used for the microtomas, where the wood is not that hard when it is soft. So we used the identifier of the anatomy of the wooden uh, types and coming from the Mediterranean. For certain types of wood which is not found, which were not found in none of the atlases, so we looked for the uh, we looked in the funds of the geo. So that's how it looks under the microscope. So cursus, Coriolus, Pinus, Populus, Betula, and Pistachia. So the results. We have get tw uh, 52 samples. Out of them we were able to identify 52 samples we were unable to identify because the internal composition was uh, damaged by the compounds of conservation. So out of 52, 13 or 14 of them, they were suffering, they have underwent conservation. So in, in, and the capillaries were filled with, uh, with the stabilizing solvent, consequently there were not identification. So cases and handles is made from populus. Then there is uh, carpinus, acer, quercus, and one is pinus, one is uh, birch, one is eonimus. In the Crimea forest it's very difficult to find eonimus of a size that you can uh, make a handle. However, such cases we've seen it and in the recent time the chances of finding it it was higher. Also noted pistachia, juniperus and tilia. So distribution is provided at the bottom picture. So, so it's a matter of the discussion. First of all, firstly, all of the wooden parts of casing and uh, knife handles uh, were made from. They're all made from the local wood, and from the point of view of the archaeological, this is not a very rich burial ground. The locals lived, resided here which is quite logical, you know, in terms of wood for the handles. And we can outline a number of uh, single cases when we have seen pistachio and pine and um, juniperus. And this is from the south bank, from the dry, dry subtropic areas, but it's not far. So most probably all of that wood is the local one, Crimean. The most widely used is Topulus. We can discuss it from the physical and chemical characteristics. It is soft wood and not often we see it in the northern parts because it's really very soft and it can be treated very well, but it's not a long lasting. But on the other side, the softness of the wood is so it does not uh, ruin the blade of the of the knife. So our experts say that very often it's used for cases and for handles of the knife. So in the Rostov region of the Sarmat warrior, pretty much of the same date, the handles and casing of the topulas that we found, they were the same, and we can see it in the bro um, Bronze Age in the Southern Europe, very often we see it, plus we have received 
A burial ground, and they're made out of the topulus as well, but it's not yet published anywhere. So these are the outcomes, and that's it from with my presentation, Dmitri. Thank you so much. That was quick, actually. Um, so topulus in middle of Middle Asia, they use it. Very interesting report. Thank you. Poplar. And so the next will be delivered by Mr. Tishin from the Kazan Federal University. Dendrochronological analysis of the archaeological wood from the island town of Sviyarsk. Results and... Wait, my apologies. We have here... So Tishin will be tomorrow, right? So... Now we're going to listen to. Um, my apologies. Now we have of um, Irina Bagatova. From the Kazan Federal University and her co authors, Alsondrievska. Um, of the Russian Academy of Sciences of, of Department in Tatarstan. So, this is of intensive of maintaining ethnographical wood in the Kazan and preservation of the archaeological wood at the Kazan Federal University. Please, hello, dear colleagues. Would like to present to your attention the report on experience of the organization of the intensive at the Kazan Federal University. We'll start from the fact that the Department of the Restoration of Heritage it was created in 2015. However, the master's program under the profile of preparation of the restoration of historical and cultural heritage it was launched in 2016. And uh, it was founded by Svetlana Pushneva. And for that time, we have uh, created a unique system of education based on the practical uh, tasks when attracting specialists from various restoration centers from the state hermitage, etc., etc. The education is delivered in the intensive format, two week intensive format, where masters have the possibility to get acquainted with the archaeological items so the practice and lectures is delivered by the restorators on the, the various directions the program is created in such a way so that during education masters can work on the practical restoration skills on the following materials that you can see here on the slides such as metal ceramics stone bone wood etc Currently, the master's program exists in Moscow and in St. Petersburg. Medvolga School of Restoration is the only school located not in central Russia. And the peculiarity of it is that it is by the list of Ministry of Culture to train the artists restorators and that's a unique program both the artistry the restoration and the modern attitudes uh, well the modern attributes of the education so it's not like you just equated with ethnographical matters but archaeological as well the target of the course dedicated to the basis of restoration of archaeological and items is to train students of how to work with real museum items and monuments. <coughs> Let's move to the importance of our training program. On the slides you can see the examples of a needed of preparing the new staff. This is our town island of Sviersk. You can see here and works in 2013 in what state 
we found in uh, how it how it got transformed into the museum. The wood was used in all areas of life, and they're the most informative sources of the material culture and most widely distributed ones. Consequently, they become the tool to search the connections between the cultures. However, no ordinary archaeological monument such findings are made. It is done by the natural characteristics of the material and the existing environment surrounding it. On the territory of our country, there's a big amount of monuments where the vegetation materials um, persist. The archaeological and wooden particles bearing in one layer carved out of wood, they, of the same wood, they can have the different grade of uh, different grade of um, solidity. So we'll go now to the structure of the cores which is delivered by the invited uh, tutor, Natalia Anatolina, great program, absolutely great, made out of two particles, which is theory and practice. You can see here the topics of the lectures which are delivered and topics of the practical tasks. How we can understand what will not harm the finding made out of the material, what conservation means can be used and what we can do it so that that is well respected by specialists as well well understood by specialists that's the questions uh, that was were important for Natalia Antolina and the answers can be given individually to each finding the intensive on preserving the ethnographical and archaeological Award is dedicated to the finding the answers to those questions containing both practical part and theoretical part. And the students study the system which will may allow them to make decisions on and each topic is a separate direction. And the total amount of the research on maintaining and safeguarding the tools of the materials and can be developed up to the final course of the lectures. Day one, it starts with the material course. At this lecture, we're looking at the characteristics of the wood construction composition. More attention is paid to the physical and mechanical characteristics of the wood as well as factors dis degrading it. The students learn on the, the those aspects that destroy the the, the the wood and we have and preservation of any fighting starts from the moment when you find it you need to take a number of operational measures that student can serve it during the uh, get to know how to conserve it preserve it uh, during the second lecture and we get acquainted with different monuments located different just so we know on the importance of temperature, humidity, and other factors. It was not oak, it was apricot. And then we have to, well, as we believe, in our department, there's preliminary research that needs to be delivered. That is done not only under the restaurant, but during the process. And our masters, they have the ability of bearing the research and having the equipment to do it. And also, uh, they learn how to, the students learn how to work with microscopes and to identify various layers of impurities and destruction of the material. Special interest is paid to identifying the type of the wood. On the slides, you can see that the students uh, they can run microscopic methods of research, and they can work themselves as well. The next stage is rest restoration material, and we're getting acquainted with the 
history of restoration of the um, items and the methods and materials used in the restoration practice. Conservation solutions are made and there's a library of samples is created. Day 5 is dedicated to conservation of the archaeological and ethnographic um, items made out of wood. The main stages are familiarized here of the works on the safeguarding of the materials. The items strengthened with different methods are used. So impregnating methods and uh, approaches are getting taught here. Topic says, 6 tells on the wood, not only about wood, but on the items which were made out of various vegetable, well, various um, organic, organic compounds, such as bark, etc. Also in the practice, the students plastify birch bark, they fix uh, the birch bark and they make a form of it. The next topic that we are reviewing is the maintenance of the wet uh, wood, preservation of wet archaeological wood. We also review the problems related to the large-scale structures and the similar course of the theoretical data gives us a big database of knowledge for our masters and they can understand by themselves what needs to be done with the object when they arrive home and they come back to their museums and there are certain objects there and during the practical um, during the practice workshops is the mechanism of working on the methods of conservation. During the experimentation samples, they use various of various soldering, uh, various uh, gluing together methods, etc. So the peculiarity here is that the students are capable to create their own lab with the experimental samples which allows them quite clearly due to the specifics the materials will provide the experimental samples to them because just the wooden items it's impossible to preserve them completely in two weeks time However, on many other courses in you know, our master's degree, such as black, uh, black metals, leather and ceramics, we provide the museum archaeological items to the students. In the recent intensive course in October 2021, the students had the possibility to have an experiment on the real archaeological museum item. We have provided them with samples which were sorted with 24 various solvents of different concentration and then each one was able to provide the, the results and to draw subsequent conclusion. Another material was birch bark Mm. The students have studied and received the demonstration of the main characteristics and problems of the material. Well, we can now move to the conclusions. As I've mentioned here, currently archaeological findings, there are quite many of them, especially if we speak about the organic materials, and we are lacking of the restore specialists of restoration, so our masters is there. Not only people from bachelors can come to us, but the restorers can come that want to increase their level of knowledge and also apply for certification as the restorer. And I shall say that this material was created from the point of view of the student who underwent this intensive course this year and me as the organizer 
Thanks to Lina Felix, only it was this intensive course we became capable because it requires preparation. So all of the materials, so the experimental samples, big, big work, big paperwork, and to organize the students. So Lina Felix only here is, delivers big work so that this intensive program would exist. She's in charge of the on the um, archaeological leather as well, intensive. So we're very grateful to her from the side of the tutors and students as well. And me as the tutor, it's important to listen to the name, to, to, to the opinion of the students. Well, well, well what did you enjoy? No, quite, quite many students that we see here. Thanks, guys, that, that you're interested in our, this. So, just have a look how many students are there in the auditorium. Students, please stand up. Those that uh, just look at the next generation of specialists, different gradu uh, diff graduated in different years, but they're here with us. They are, me as the student, I would like to note that despite the fact, uh, the limited time for such a complex material and mysterious as wood and this was load 20, 24, 24 students and just one tutor. We have studied loads of interesting stuff, loads of useful information we have acquired and the important thing that I would like to outline. Everything was clear and straightforward. Yes, it was difficult, it was mixed, but as the result we have received huge amount of data which allowed us to get oriented in the world of the archaeological wood. So I would like to say the words of gratitude. Also thank you. Are you ready after intensive for the work or you just need to or you need additional trainings. Yes, I do require additional trainings, like two weeks theoretically. I have acquired a lot of interesting information. And now you have the basis and you can continue with your development. Well, as for now, I'm a little bit afraid. Mm. It became more. Clear. It's, it's it's clear where to get developed. Thank you also. Thank you for your comments. And I would like to add that we have the possibility, all the students, they can work with, they can work headed by the we do our best so that our students, after finishing the masters that can be attested so that they have the attestation passports ready and the big words of gratitude to Natalia Anatolina year 2019 and year 2021 of course from your point of view or frankly speaking you have big experience you know it and the new generation especially wood it's very difficult for us it's very difficult for study and it's even more complex than than metal and it's great that the new generation is going there thank you then we go in accordance with the plan we have the online Maya Filatovna Candidate of Historical Sciences, Junior Researcher of the Institute of Archaeology and Ethnography of Russian Academy of Sciences, Siberian branch from Novosibirsk. So she's going to talk on dendrological dating of wooden architecture in the Novosibirsk region. We see you, we cannot yet see the presentation. Okay, there's now there's a black screen. Mm -hmm. Okay, clear. So we can expand it towards all of the screen. Mm -hmm. 
Hello, my name is Maya Filatova. I'm from Novosibirsk. I work with the team from Krasnoyarsk. And they and the whole team is here listed on the slide. I'd like to say that Novosibirsk region it's very specific. And our center is the city of Novosibirsk. It's quite young, it's 127 years. However, the region is existing for centuries. And there are interesting archaeological monuments located there, which were important objects for the Russian history. Like Umrinsky Fortress or Suzunsky Factory, and we have the Russian era monuments were made out of wood and there are elderly monuments plus so the interest towards the dendrochronology and the need to create the chronology was set and said by different scientists so in 2010 there was a first attempt to create the chronology was made but we have outlined a number of problems which we're trying to resolve in 2016, but we accomplished them in 2019 only, I mean the resolution of the problems. And as the results, um, and I present you with this report. So in 2019 we have accumulated samples from all of the forestry with the ancient wood being present in Novosibirsk region and at the, and at the boundary with other regions, um, Altai, Kemerova and other regions. We did it in order, well, due to the fact that uh, the wood for construction was taken from those areas, and to answer the question, we ha that is the strategy that we have selected. Have only 19 points and 327 samples. Mainly, it was uh, regular pine, and also. And also from the fir tree. Siberian fir tree. So in order to date the archaeological buildings, we have studied the wood from the architectural structures. So we looked at the wooden structures and ancient wooden structures. So we were acting within two projects. So the work is being performed for quite a while already, and we are accumulating data here. So the wood was taken from the city of Kuybyshev, Suzul, Kalevan, and from various villages of Mashkov, Suzun, Sardensk, and other regions of Novosibirsk region. They are present on the slide, well, some of them. And in our lab, we carefully stored the collection of the monuments from the Umrinsky fortress, Kremashokova burial ground and fragments of this uh, Pasky uh, church from Kuybyshev district, uh, plus uh, separate fragments of uh, wood uh, from the monuments of Iron and Bronze Age. You can see how the monuments look. The, the fortress is partially reconstructed. <coughs> so let's go back to the chronology of wood. On the slide you can see the potential of its cre uh, creation. So approximately the chronology on the life which is 250 to 170 years. Then the large hope was done from the wood from the architectural. <coughs> And then there is archaeological wood. And only this year we were capable to come from the life um, from the life forests to the architectural structure and connect them together and to construct 376 years worth of chronology. We have found that in the forest zone, it's quite difficult to work 
because the signal within the chronology it is it, it differs significantly and in order to create it we need to take loads of samples and loads of samples of the uh, we can take them out of the chronology because of the bad signal and in order to date the samples from the archaeological structures we need to take the wood which is uh, was growing maximum close to the archaeological findings but in the first place well you you do not know in advance which wood was used so we consequently we have created big volume of samples so the those that are created on the, constructed on the Orb River they correlate with each other it means that the archaeological wood which was found on the river of Orb it can be dated on the basis of this chronology once we have the chronology based on on the western part they correlate better with samples of the western forestry masses but as a whole after um, treating all of the material we can say that in the Novosibirsk region there is a signal being between the chronologies in can we can create create one generalized chronography after delivering such work we were able to date a number of uh, buildings actually and I would like to stop here that when we create for separate forestry when we create the chronology we uh, have found the interdependency here that it was uh, there with stages and we will look deeper into that detail but I can say that it relates to the resettlements and we can track it in accordance with the wood we also have a sample of very good creation of the chronology in the Omsk region live wood architectural and archaeological and we were able to deliver the chronology with 546 years so now let's move to the architecture of Novosibirsk region like I said, we studied wood from uh, the monuments of this wooden fort um, settlement, and we also took wood uh, from houses that, based on their architectural uh, features, should be, should have been on that on that list, but they were weren't there. Last night, Seventh Street uh, Sorochovka Village uh, shows has one of those houses because of its features was assigned to the buildings of the beginning of the 19th century but uh, the dental chronological analysis showed it was built in 1904 or something it has 13 uh, rings there the front end was uh, built uh, horizontally uh, sloped roof typical for the 19th century small windows and uh, <clears throat> it turned out that in our region uh, building traditions uh, remained uh, for that particular type of design well into the 20th century and we've been building 3D models for structures that we study and we are going to send uh, this data to the service of architectural service uh, soon because it's uh, easy to work with them more interesting to work with them you can uh, mark uh, samples and logs that were chosen for the gender chronological analysis can work not with pictures only but with a model which uh, is very convenient and this data in general can be very useful especially uh, if there is some if someone is going to reconstruct a house or relocated 
Also, a uh, house on Zarechne 6th Street was irradiated. We were gender chronologically disappointed. It was built in 1907, even though uh, you can see uh, the way it's built of logs from walls. But it's still uh, early 20th century, not late 19th century. Then we started in the, on uh, a house, a monument of uh, fortresses in the settlement of Yune, Commoner 20th Street. Uh, the date says uh, 1882, and turned ecologically it was confirmed because our examination showed it was built not later than in 1881. And the last house is uh, in the city of Kuybyshev, which is built in immersion style of the early 19th, 20th century. Sorry, uh, the merchant Kornin house is what it's called. He had a house uh, connected to the to a trade uh, pavilion in downtown Kuybyshev. And uh, the dating was very close, it almost hit the spot. Even though we didn't find any under bark rings, it is uh, dated uh, 1912, 10. Um, some of the rings must have been lost, so the dates are in line. Conclusions. We have collected a massive collection of archaeological samples, about uh, 500 in total, that keeps growing with the new samples joining. A chrono chronology dating spanning 377 years has been built, and now we're dating uh, the Marininsky Ostrog, uh, and we have some interesting dates chronological dating projects, and I think we will make many more dating chronologies from the north to the south can be solved, as it turns out. In the future, we will be paying more attention to the stages of deforestation or forest felling and associating them with the historical sources and getting information about uh, what forests were felled in the late 19th, uh, early 20th century. I'm open to questions. Thank you. Any questions? Well, there being no questions, we would like to proceed. Mikhail Kapeki, researcher in the Museum of the History of Konstadt. Methods of conservation of wet archaeological wood on the example of artifacts of from Peter the Great's battleship Portsmouth and Curious Bridge. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. We had some technical malfunction, uh, not, not a malfunction, but just some technical thing, and uh, the operator will be switching the slides, and I will be telling him what to do it. Well, you know my topic, the conservation of Wet uh, wood object has many technological variants. It, it's based on whether it's deformed or not, on the climate, on the presence of uh, toxicity around it. The right interpretation will help you conclude whether certain polymers can be used, whether deep impregnation should be done, what drying should be done, what antiseptics should be chosen. Choosing the right option depends on the knowledge of the restorator and the state of an artifact, but choosing materials and chemicals comes with recommendations. I'll be referring to Galina Perebrazhenska. Restoration materials should meet the following criteria. The main criteria to reinforcement materials, longevity. You should use only those materials that can 
keep their uh, strength properties for a long time, they should be rever reversible. They have to have an ability to regenerate, they should be neutral to wood, inert. They should not change their linear size because of aging or other factors, but they should be elastic and change their linear size together with the material. Reinforcement materials using preservation should not have any big, uh, should, uh, the wood should keep its color when it's being extracted from its medium. I think you know all of this, but I'm telling you because you should know what the basic uh, requirements we use to choose uh, the pr to preserve the big sh boats uh, that we salvaged, musified. I won't be describing the methods generally accepted, but I will be telling you about new ones that we were using. Peg treatment is uh, not a new one. Polythene glycol with nephilization is widely used. The main drawback here is that impregnations on create a hermetic shell. It messes with the oxygen interaction. The wood stops breathing. A normal impregnation should not prevent normal wet exchange with the environment. Galina Perbrashensky said that. Another option using as a conservation s solution of silicon oils. Let's look at it on the example of the methods developed by the Wen Smith Texas University that published a book called Conservation in Archaeology Using Polymers. The author describes the methods that he used for conservation of small wooden elements from the Carabelle uh, sail ship. The author believes that polyethylene glycol impregnation uh, gets the water out of, of uh, oversaturated water saturated wood, but they cannot stabilize layers, but uh, silicon organic can do it well that binds the surface layers with the deep layers. We use a two-stage method of for conservation. The wood samples were put in a bath and then acetone created vacuuming. This part of the experiment showed that the depth of acetone penetration depends on the time and stage of vacuum. And the polymer will get to the depth of the acetone depth. Changing water with acetone was done in one to three days of silicone polymer impregnation. Silicone oils were uh, liquid polyorgan silicon, liquid polymers, silicon analogs or organic compounds. Another paper by this author showed the silicon used in these experiments. Polyorgan silicons are a kind of organic polymers, hydrofibrosizing liquids that we used in our works to preserve large scale artifacts from of wet archaeological wood. The use of uh, silicon organic has been written about by Galina Alexander a long time ago. So, the specific technologies are an achievement of the authors. Those who want to try for the organic select sense in practice, uh, you can use these Russian models, PMS, silicon, oils, GKG, polyphobic, all molecular caoutchouc, SKN, uh, rubber oils, SKN. France developed a method for conservation of for wood with gamma beams. Two methods. Synthetic smalls with further gamma beams kills all microbes. It includes a process of radiation stimulated polymerization. A reversible conservation happens. The polymer hardens. It likes uh, it like a tooth filler hardening in the cavity of a tooth. Treatment of wood by gamma oils to kill fungus and leophilization drying and polyethylene gall impregnation. 
the current uh, the, the gamma beams in this method is a major interceptic it doesn't affect the further process of conservation based on the well-known methods this picture shows you the equipment from the green oblique lab just a part of it these uh, pictures show of conservation of a ship from the two to the second century from Leon and a small boat of the same time the second century. The lab is very impressive and you start to respect people who created a fabric like that, sorry a factory like that for conservation. But if we analyze it you should notice the thesis, uh, repeated thesis of using uh, wet exchange with the atmosphere. I use it because it's important. I know it from experience. Emperor Bajanska confirmed it because it's on the main factor in using your conservants. It led us to hardware for instance, and there are many of them. At one of the exhibitions, I met one of the manufacturers of uh, water repellent hydro material, Hydro Plus. Some of their works are patented. Wood is not so stable to the action of water and wetness. It cracks, deforms because of that. Wet wood is a good medium for fungus, mold, and algae which leads it to spots of all kinds of colors and destroys the tree then. Wood should be covered with lacquer, paint, olive, but it takes one of the biggest advantage away, the ability to breathe. Treatment of wood with hydrofrobazine solutions, it keeps air going and it keeps the water coming in. I'm going back to the French example now. This is a camera, a chamber of gamma radiation, four meters under water. A special source goes into the chamber where the chamber wood is, and this is how the radiation happens. So this is an example of a Roman ship, and this is a Roman boat. This is me during treatments and uh, here there is an option of a test uh, treatment of water by hydrophobizator. The upper part is not treated by hydrophobe on the right and the lower one is uh, in the le on the left you don't see how it happens. It's different from the right side. All industrial hydrophobizers are an oligomeric compounds and their solutions. Oligomeres are between monomeres and polymeres. These are polymeres with small sipids because of polymerization of species, molecules occur. And the surface of the treated materials is no longer wet with water like uh, paraffin, but uh, the stages between these molecules are so large that the surface breathes and uh, the composition near guard includes isopropyl spirit and an active substance. Polyorganic slug stun, which kettle is a catalyst. Hydrophob hydrophobes, because of chemical links with fibrous implementations, act like that, and you get a surface which is very stable to external effects. It keeps fungus and microorganisms and mold from growing on the surface of wood. It doesn't change the. Co the um, Outlook improves the mechanical properties of wood. No film is formed. Hydrophobization of wood is very important to increase longevity of wood to restore artifacts from wood. Silicon organics has been used for to modify wood for a long time. Modifying wood by these compounds 
has a few set properties that are determined by the choice of the catalyst and the technologies used. Elena Pokrovska, Doctor of Technical Sciences of the State Moscow State University, proposed to use the method of soft modifications for conservation of Zolchistov monuments so that it goes, goes only to the surface, not deep, and the intermolecular links stay unaffected. The artifact is treated with phosphor organic compounds and silicon organic compounds at a temperature of 20 degrees and the time of impregnation of three hours. Ethereum phospholytic acid works when polar gas looks like sands. The surface is hydrophobic, hydrostable. The modifiers that come into contact at the MB temperatures give covalent and hydrogen links without interfering with the composite of wood. In 2007, the company developed uh, a series of specialized hydrophobic substances. It's called Niagard wood. These hydrophobizers are compositions intended for protection of surface from wo of wood from wetness and moisture. The results are published. I should tell you that the effect from treatment by the Niagard composition is determined not only by the choice of the active substance, but by the right solvent also. Special research shows that one and the same active substance with different solvents, once they dry up, distributes differently within the structure of wood. As a result, an incorrect solvent like used, like a cheap one, can lead to the wood losing its breathing properties or an inability to repel water. The unique action of the Niagara composition is based on the right components and the right combination. Over 10 years we've been using this for conservation of large-scale uh, artifacts and they are very stable. <coughs> you should prepare your wood properly. The method. A wet archaeological wood is what we lifted from underwater. Then we needed to choose the red drying for this. Our objects were dried in natural conditions with freezing in the winter time. This method calls for constant observation of materials for exclusion of thaw water, rain water in the spring and in the winter. But it's cheap and it's very simple in a, and natural. Canadian restaurants were the first to do it. They say that drying and freezing in natural conditions leads to no cracks in settings. It applies to large scale wet wood artifacts. It's only done in natural conditions, under a tent or in a hangar without heating or ventilation. Ever since 1988, in Kotka, in the Sea Museum of Finland, we have the St. Nicholas Frigate that died in the second battle. He was, he, it was found in 1949. And uh, in 1953, the research started. Once the elements of the ship were lifted, they've been under the roof of a special shed, and the artifacts under are under the impact of uh, natural conditions for a long time. I come, I've been coming there for 15 years. They're stable. No, they stay the same. This year. According to the museum, the Finnish archaeologists are planning to assemble, assemble the ship. These artifacts have not been impregnated with peg, as far as I know. With the right process in place, no water gets in, no thaw water, no rain water, no cracks. In and no loosens, or, or between one to three percent. You can see how the holes in the frames and the wooden boards are. 
we've seen that when we were conserving all of our objects, including the Portsmouth, it was most striking, and we got good results. This one shows you the assembled and of the board part of the linear battleship Portsmouth. While we were assembling one hole from going away from another was or the misalignment was not more than two centimeters. Another good example of good results is freezing large scale objects is uh, it's this bark. Kiryarsk. It was lifted in Ob, in the river of Ob. Please go back. It was in an unheated hangar for three years. The elements lifted of the Peter the Great ship, Portsmouth, and the elements of the constructions of the ship were put on special pallets that provided for voluminous ventilations up, up and down. They were covered by waterproof tents, exposed to air to, to year for two years, two cold winters. Another treatment, uh, a similar treatment was done on the granite bark from Leningradsk, from the Leningrad region. The Ladosk, sorry, boat in the region of Alansa, built in the 19th century. It was also free and freezed. Same picture, same picture. Mangesian uh, boats, elements, they were dried in natural conditions because there was n no other experience. Our, our, our several archaeological team from Neftyagansk did it and ship elements in the local museum draw attention to their well, to their good state despite no special efforts to conserve them, but their ecological wood spent was in underwater and under the ground, but the ventilation and cold winters in these regions have had a positive effect on them, which has kept uh, the uh, boat uh, in a good shape. This list goes on and on, but uh, I think I you had heard enough examples to make your conclusions. You have to dry them up in uh, open air with monitoring under tents or roofs. Uh, it gives you good results for large-scale ships. I think it's the only alternative and economically efficient after the first stage of drying. You should clean the wood from dirt and sand and rot. Whilst drying, cleaning can lead to destruction of artifacts before, because of the soft uh, wet wood. Once dried, the wooden elements get harder and uh, it's easier to clean them. At all of our objects, after a two time treatment, we had no fungus or mold. The color always stayed the same. Uh, and we used a special impregnation antiseptic nemid 440, which showed good results, and its activity, uh, period of activity, is very long. After a treatment with antiseptics or impregnation, no need to dry. On the next day, your artifact it can, is ready for the finish shank treatment by Niagara. A few examples of a linear boat, uh, Portsmouth. This is what it looks like now in a museum. The Kiryarsk boat in the river of Ob. This is what the nose part looks like, and this is what it looked like after the first treatment. And this is what it looks now in the museum in Nizhnevartovsk. The object is uh, they're building a facility for it now, its, it's size is about 30 meters. The Finsky uh, boat, a Finnish boat found in the Finnish 
See, and this is what it looked like. This is a keel, and this is um, keel part is uh, in the museum of the brig. Another from the uh, example from the Dalne Bay. When we are working, when we were working with these objects, we saw an radical change in the size of the objects, of the frames, of the keels, uh, in the wooden boards, uh, the final geometrical characteristic change, but not a lot. Sometimes the fastening holes can uh, um, be different, but it's not a problem and you can assemble uh, the element in the authentic form and you can see visitors uh, the real thing from the 18th and 19th century thank you very much Lanit Anatolievich very interesting unique objects what I would like to see in your report when you're choosing between methods we see that the wood was well preserved it was very thick it doesn't take for deep impregnation, probably just some work with the upper layer. So the freezing method uh, works for this. What I would like to see in your report is some preliminary research. If it opened with wood densities, uh, wood species, um, and the initial wetness values, we'd have understood why you decided to go with that approach. Our eyes can see what you're talking about, but we need figures. Setting of one to three percent. Is it tangential or, or cross sectional, longitudinal, radial? In the radial, a little less, in the tangential, a little more. How do you control your settings? Do you have any pictures? Yes. Yes, we come up with templates, big, big templates. Because we're talking big shapes, long shapes. So we come up with these templates uh, and then or blueprints, and then we apply them to see if there is any misalignment, uh, any dents, no dents, or the linear ship was built of oak, no pine, huh? Um, mostly that. It was. Uh, Ash tree, the main beam, but the merchant ship is uh, pine, made of pine. It looks the worst of all, but still, it's a good example. Uh, but you ex uh, took them from cold waters, and the boat has minimum, a minimum salt content. So your boats are well preserved, and you got lucky. But it took a lot of effort. I understand that. I recognize that. You are citing also a very well-known restoration specialist, but um, going back to my first comment, Galina Alexandrovna, for example, is a big expert on ethnographic wood and polychromic sculpture, but speaking of polythene glycols, uh, she is talking about uh, the preservation uh, around your project, but Olga Vladimir, who we're talking now, says uh, you should only use PEG. When we're choosing the method, first we should open with some preliminary research. We should look at the physical characteristic. We look, should look at how well preserved they are, and then we decide what works for what. You see only draw the drawbacks in polymeoglycols, because uh, the Neolithic and Mesolithic uh, stuff only take peg and sag and nothing else will work. Peg is hydrophobic. We need to keep the shape, the size. We need to make it readable. Pegs will help you do that. So please uh, be careful with your citations. I would like to explain very simple one more minute. The first and the second objects were from uh, from demand archaeology. We needed to rescue them, salvage them quickly. So we were winging it and we were learning as we were doing it. Valentina Ivanova has a question. Uh, 
который ему настолько забивает поры, так что не переводите цитаты Галина Александровича. Скорее всего, это было сказано не сто лет назад, когда она работала с Госмиром. Uh, because uh, she must have said a very long time ago when she was working with other companies, institutions, she may have changed her perspective from that time. Silicon organic, low tension, good pores, it opens up the pores. What I'm concerned about. How do you get to an equilibrium by trying? How, we could, how can you control it? How can you control your wood? Freezing is very good. Ethers are good too. I'm saying that, that in Russian climatic conditions it works. In Crimea it wouldn't work. The Museum of Sea Archaeology in Kotka gave me that idea. Valentina Ivanovna, let's finish with her. With that boat, you were unfreezing it because you found it in fall. But one year later, uh, it was not still at equilibrium. It had moisture in it, wetness. The only thing that could help deal with it was the heat. And ancient organics calls for polycondensation processes. They take oxygen from the air. Ethylene spirit is used in the molecules, but I'm sorry, the speaker, the person is not using microphone, so it's hard to hear what she's saying. So they can either be amorphic structures or something else. Thank you very much for your comments. One thing, though, you said that your, in your case, the moisture didn't go deep. We have the same case. We have a similar case. The depth of destruction was not high, but the witness content was high. Maybe I didn't, it didn't come out right, but where the roof is leaking, down there, there was 60% of moisture. There was destruction, and there was wetness all along the depth. Even while the top was being dried, the bottom could not dry. Thank you very much for these um, very detailed uh, explanations, but archaeological wood can uh, have been in a different state of preservation, so chemists, botanists, experts, biologists should work together to uh, on that. Valentin Ivanovna, maybe the use of uh, construction hydrophobic impregnators in museums it concerns me, it disturbs me. The quality may be good, but they are for an open atmosphere, but whenever we put uh, something like that in an open site of museum, the vapors can affect some steel structures in the museum, because we're talking about museum restorations, because materials should not uh, mm, be toxic to others. 
I understand. But all these new solutions, we would like them to be tested on uh, exp through experiments. Some experimental work has to be done before they can be used on unique exhibits. Okay, we'll keep that in mind. Thank you for your report. But still, first we have to do some experimental work. But I understand that it's quite often that it's quite often the case. I understand that. Maybe we should uh, leave that for later. We have Olga Lazowska, Wooden Housekeeping Objects and Vision Facility of the Mesolithic Site of Zamosi 2. Olga represents a uh, candidate head of the Experimental Toysiology Laboratory Institute for the History of Material Culture, Russian Academy of Sciences, St. Petersburg. Thank you. Dear colleagues, for the first time, I, you are at the, this conference of archaeological wood, and I'll do my best to present my materials on the settlement that I observed for many years already, and share my experience that I gained there for 30 years. Okay, it's good. So the settlement is uh, Zamoistia. Due to the good condition, paleo geographical conditions and conditions, it has the um, wet peatlands. So the settlement there, was since 1989, had by Mr. Lazowski and the three um, excavation compounds. We did also headed by Andrei Mazurkevich. Five cultural layers from Neolithic, from late Mesolithic to Middle Neolithic. You can see it on the screen. All cultural layers are within the subpropel and aerobic conditions covered by lake, clay, and peat and the water was the level of water was fluctuating but looking at the wood the majority of time it was underwater um, until there was uh, extended swamping of the territory that's how it looked this territory territory at the end of the 19th century, then there's global melioration at the end of the 20s, one straightened of the excavator and all of the works, they cut the settlement. It's ch channelized the Dubna River in 1989 when the settlement was discovered and then that's the looks of how it looks to well today. So the 
Spring floods, they flood everything. And the Zabolutsky Lake continues to shrink. All of those difficult conditions, of fluctuations of the level of water, and lands in affected the preservation of the wood. We will not consider them because they stayed there. So the upper layer in the wooden inventory is the early Neolithus. Not many findings, but they're, they're, they're looking good in quite good condition. Small spoons, cups. It's calendar, yes, as. And the upper layer of the late Mesolithus contained loads of fragments of birch and artifacts included various aspects of the geometrical of various geometrical forms you can see the, the, the slate also and the bottom layer of mesolitis was the most filled with the wooden residue of the natural formation despite the fact that there are no findings as well as the treated wood. For the first two seasons, uh, 160 items that we found we were maintained, handles, uh, arts, kitchenware, apart from the artifacts, we from the cultural layer, we review them as the program of natural dissolution of the wood, despite the fact that it is related to the activities of the ancient person. In addition to artifacts, we have found the artifacts, as it looks on the picture, without the treatment, with the length up to two and a half meters. And in one case, it was identified. In the underwater part of the settlement, they were in parallel and they were interpreted or just to catch fish. And it tells us of this. The site of the river was used by many generations of settlers. And it stayed there in place for future research. All of those stru structures are dated back in the late Mesolithus. Next to it, in 1989, we found two corner-shaped structures out of the same. They were complete con in 2013. And the third one was all three of them, uh, that's the early Neolithus. So if you can see that, no. that's what we have found, it's identified, this was a man, we have taken this one as the monolith and we have delivered it to the state hermitage for restoration. To package it we use gypsum steel sheets. The second one we disassembled it with the precise fixation of each one of it. So it is unpacked in Hermitage after transport. That is the condition of it at the beginning of at the beginning of preservation. Conservation was done by the certification lab with the polyethylene glycol. I do Neolithic fish traps. This is the first experience of conservation of it with land. And it is at the final stage of treatment. Just to compare a small fragment with tying of it 
in situ and then at the end of the restoration. Currently, it is exposed at the restoration stage in the old village at St. Petersburg. Unfortunately, due to lighting, I was unable to make good picture out of it, but I'll do my best. As the largest collection of the wooden actors in the Volga Aka in between rivers, from the first moments of study of the monument, the first party was sent to Vladimir, Vladimir Lazovsky, sent it to Belarus Technological University, named after Kirov, where the group headed by Kazanskaya under the patented method have dealt with the treatment of artifacts in the number of years. You can see the content of the method, I'm not going to say about it aloud. Uh, here the result is important in accordance with the drawing of the 2.3, and radial and 1.9 to 2.3 lengthwise. It got shrink figures of the uh, birds, floaters, different structures which makes it more difficult to study it. However, the items were well preserved and they're now exposed in Sergei Passat Museum Reserve. In 1994, Within the grant of the National Research uh, Service Archaeology Cantonal de Freiburg of Switzerland, the conservation was performed with the method of with PEG. They didn't deform and they didn't change the dimensions. In accordance with the recommendation of the, our Swiss colleagues, and Daniel Ramsiero, and with, uh, with the support of Biat Uga, Professor in 1907, we started our own program with the conservation of the wooden, uh, uh, wooden items with sucrose. So it can be done in the field in case if it's needed, plus it can be easily covered by artifacts. So there are we have conservated with sugar 211 items with different successes, different programs. The sucrose conservation has been patented in 1904 in the United States, and it was used in the Western Europe to preserve archaeological objects. These some items from the settlement treated with sucrose. Just look at the ornament. After the conservation, we can see the, the ornament and etc. So we were able to treat some volumetric stuff. So some cracks, another result of the conservation. But they have appeared uh, well before the excavating, so we can have a look at the existence of the objects before their archaeologization. So all of the cracks. So when we were able to say that these are these are the drying, and they maintained good form and fine marks on the surface during the conservation. When long-term drying in the natural conditions, say in packaging, was was not hermetically sealed, for instance. So all of them they have very high grade of uh, treatment of the surface, and it reflects the maintenance of the wood. Without the conservation, we also have the knots, knots of the nets. And made out of willow. For it to understand the degraded wood of the, of the settlement, I'll show you a part of my experiment. This is the dynamics of shrinking of water filled, treat, non treated part of the wood of the open air in the closed premise. You can see the dimensions 83 by 73 and the contour that shows. So what was uh, remained after 20 days? So with two diameters we had it one 
one pink and one yellow. And after the bridge, as a result, you, you, the results you can see in the table. So, the pink one, the pink diameter became a corner and the green one. So it's 265 degrees of the tearing angle. It's unstoppable. And it's impossible to reverse this process. Once it dries, that's it, it shrinks. I did uh, 20 years after the completion of conservation. These are the numbers in the field. And then after the end of the conservation. And what I did just a couple of days ago, like in 20 years, some numbers are jumping. And uh, it's difficult to measure very fragile things. But the overall tendency is that there are no items of shrinking. I cannot say that the sucrose method is the unique and the best, but I can say that but to maintain the all methods are good to preserve the archaeological wood and the wooden artifacts. And the recent digging out campaign, which were preserved with sucrose, the majority of them is give, they provided to Hermitage, where some artifacts were enclosed. And I do hope that I will tell, be able to tell you more on that. Olga, thank you so much. I would like to add that the methods of um, impregnation with sucrose and PEG, they were developing in parallel. And many countries and museums have used it. And in our lab, we use the modified sucrose. And maybe, well, it is well conserved. It's, everything works well. Olga, thank you. Two online reports we have of um, Sergei Maratovich who is going to deliver his presentation tomorrow. And all the reports are very interesting. Everybody wants to tell on their work. Uh, work is very complex and very thorough and very multifaceted. So I'm not stopping anyone. But we have another two reports that we want to listen to. And we go online now and Sergei Maratovich. Sergei Maratovich will start tomorrow with him. Thank you for agreeing to do so. And now we have the Raisa and Ruslanov. Рида Русланова и Евгений Русланов Wooden pavements of the medieval settlement Уфа 2 Attribution, dating, experience and problems of field conservation and creating a museum space I'm doing my best to launch the presentation now to provide you the screen demo just a second, just a second. Uh, can you see anything now? No. What time is it in Ufa? It's almost 9 o'clock, 9 p.m. Oh, well, thank you for being us. Then, double thanks. Are we going to make it full screen? Yeah. It must be so big that it's hard to uh, go to full screen. I have been listening to you all this time and I um, admire all of you. It's working now. Wow. Yeah, just you can do it like this. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'll be telling you about the uh, wooden pavements in, of our medieval town of R2. It's a unique monument of the medieval age times. Um, 
My co-author is Ruslan Evgeny Vladimirovich, and uh, the Ufa 2 town is located in the center of uh, Ufa, the capital city of Bashkortostan, and uh, on a cape uh, made up by two ravines. What that makes it so famous is that it's been known ever since the 7th or 8th century and the topographic plan of Ufa of the 17th century, of the 18th century, and so on, uh, show it. Uh, the monument is located in the center of other archaeological objects, uh, quite large too, and it was obviously during a time the administrative military trade center of this district. Uh, this monument uh, was first uh, mentioned by 1953 by in a publication by P. F. Sherikov, um, Peter Sherikov, who found the first artifacts of this uh, town when he was uh, looking at the uh, trenches uh, during gasification efforts. In uh, Nias Majitov took on from there. But this territory was built up and only in the early 2000s. This uh, territory started freeing up uh, old housing, they started to demolish it, and uh, uh, major works began uh, and headed by the Bash University and then um, Mr. Farid Solgatov. Uh, major excavation works were carried out along with the research and uh, it was decided to preserve this monument in the histori state historical um, nature reserve and museum. Uh, Ufar II was founded there and this is when ex more excavation started. In 2012, I had an expedition there. Evgeny Vladimirovich headed it a similar expedition in 2015 until 2021. We were excavating there. We uncovered 2,062 square meters. We researched a layer at a depth of more than three meters. The monument is located right there. And in the center, you have the Pushkina Street. This is uh, the Salavati Life Square. <coughs> so this large territory belongs to the monument. This is uh, the year 2007 with the old housing in place and then they started demolishing them, freeing the space up. Uh, the excavations and laid bare material that has over 7,000 exhibits, six or 7,000 exhibits, Di all different. Now there is no more excavation works for the most part. I would like to point out that the territory, it's uh, at the entrance to the city, it's very attractive for modern housing uh, developers, of course. And the first excavation works in the early 2000s, like in the 2006, uh, were aimed uh, at uh, researching or like uh, surveying this territory rapidly, fast. The site of the town was uncovered and the adjoining territory there was a fortification that we documented and the cultural layers, the upper layers, they are they show a continuous settlement. Two construction horizons were uncovered. The second and fifth century uh, shows uh, that it was this is when the first people came in, and then the fifth to eighth century, which was the year. This was a time when uh, it was blossoming. Так у нас нет звука.
А, ну давайте так. Нет интернета. Давайте до следующего докладчика. Выханеев Виктор Васильевич. Да? Next speaker. Hello, dear colleagues. We have Victor online. I can see you. I'm starting my slides. Can you see my present? Can you see my slides? Yes, we can see it. Clearly, dear colleagues. I would like to tell you. Uh, about my staff, I'm an I'm an archaeologist, practicing archaeologist, based on our research, a joint expedition of the Institute of Material Culture Rank and the Hermitage that's been studying the antique city of Acre in the Kerchnik Palif ever since 2011, when you're studying antique uh, archaeology monuments, wooden monuments are a rare find. Of course, some of them should uh, draw merit our attention today. Uh, do you see the new, the next slide? The antique city of Accra is uh, located uh, in the eastern part of Crimea, in the Kerchinsky Strait. It was localized. Давайте на Сергея Маратовича попросим. Да. Опять у нас перестановки. У нас не получается. Да. А, не. Или Акра появляется. Нет, Акра не появляется. Well, I ask Сергей Маратович to fill in then. Uh, we need your help. We need your report. So I guess we'll have to listen. Take a listen to your report today. Where well, you're having internet difficulties. The problem of uh, the saving misification of garden would so get my candidate of geographical sciences, a associate professor. Russian State University for the Humanities. Well, today we're all daunted by the COVID. When I learned about the conference, I was going to make uh, that report that I had in mind, but uh, all the borders were shut down during the lockdown, and the person who was uh, working on the RFA, another machineries he uh, was laid with COVID and he's still recovering and once I'm done with my uh, array of 40 artifacts well I don't know when I'll get there but I hope that since we are in this conference will I will share some information with you 10 years ago this area of studying and preserving the sea and culture heritage saw the formation of the association of the underwater and cultural heritage of Russia misification conservation all that kind of started uh, to get some ground and the Museum of uh, the World Ocean located in Kaliningrad decided to hold a big collection, get a big collection of boats. 
national boats and also they were looking for some archaeological items. By that time, we knew of an item like this, we had an item in mind, we knew the item they were pursuing, I mean it was this little boat from, which I'll show, from the river of Oka, and they wanted to keep it. But when discussions started, and I was their consultant at the time, and when discussions started as to how it could be done, it was a wild place, no roads, the boat was uh, um, in a state that was not identified, it was uh, not known how to deal with it. We went to Veliki Novgorod to Emma Kublo, who spent a week uh, sort of workshop, workshop with us, she shared a lot of information with us and we knew that the peg integration method would be the best way or the most optimum way from 1500 to 2000 maybe. Uh, and uh, she said, if uh, it goes well, well, go ahead with it. Let's get some. Let's get the ball rolling. She said. Then we'll uh, add some research there. And by the time we started thinking about it, thinking about how to to get this thing from there to where we wanted it to be. Mm, uh, along the way, transformed into the approach of preservation of large-scale or large-sized objects that could be salvaged underwater because any shipwreck, any boat underwater is uh, tens of meters of some construction material you need to find a place, a ba you can put it in a bath, and you need to disassemble it element by element, piece by piece, you have to preserve it and then you have to reassemble it. So with that in mind we came up with an approach that was met with some administrative issues, I think, and now it's back on our agenda. So I decided to share the work that we laid the groundwork for back then now and preservation of objects of uh, cultural heritage uh, will be something that you will hear about at our conferences we are with you and we hope that you will take part in these works or share some device or some criticism. Next slide. <laughs> this is our plan. Here is our plan. We need to see how to transport it, how to remove salt, how to reinforce the structure of materials of degraded wood, how to remove moisture, how to preserve and musify then. It was a wild place. The river, the Oka is not that wild, but some places of it are wild. The banks of yeah, the Yenisei, the river, the banks of the Ob can be also wild sometimes, and sometimes they can be civilized. It depends on where, on the place. This is what we came up with. Conservation of objects uh, from wood of underwater cultural heritage. Uh, first we need to define where the object is in order not to transport it over big, uh, vast distances. If we're talking the sea, you can use a barge to lift it up, but if it's like some remote Siberian lake, it's different, or river. And also, you have to ship the, uh, this object to an underwater, uh, to the place of musification over vast distances, and it had to be moved to Kaliningrad. 
and thirdly, uh, autonomous treatment and conservation of wood by using modern microprocessing means. We understand that our technology is in the order the technology that we have should be so adaptive that any place with electricity or with some communication like where you have a cellular connection uh, would be the right place for uh, doing this minimization of oxygen as influence to the city and minimization of the impact when the object is moved for under from one conditions to others and uh, treatment and conservation of objects from any type of wood uh, of any size and found both in uh, salt water and in fresh water. We didn't know what we, was, we were getting into, actually, because when we started, other major uh, cities started uh, lifting wooden ships. Two classical examples, the Vasta and the one from England, that ship, I can't think of the name, and Vasta from Sweden. The problems uh, that were uncovered uh, don't apply to archaeological on-land diggings or excavations, but it is a separate topic. My, we needed to have some isolated container that could be placed within which could be placed a metallic structure uh, for fastening. There had to be some instrumentation devices that could uh, be used to measure, to take measures and monitor remotely. We chose a, contro a controller and uh, artificial water-soluble wax polyethylene gly glycol. And this is where we started. This is the jewel, the center piece of our story. A little boat, a diameter 70 centimeters, uh, length 6.83 meters, uh, uh, the aft is 0 0.6 meters, the nose 0 0.55 meters, uh, the sides are 0 0.6 meters high. Six kilometers away from Alexmo now. Uh, we believed that the first thing we had to do was to extract the object and to clean it and to treat it and then we had to um, do control measurements and samples and use antiseptics treatments because Emma Konstantinovna insisted on it. We had to place the the object in a carcass structure and fix it there, hold it there, put it in isolated container, change oxygen with nitrogen, and put it on a container. Put the container on a vehicle and take it to the place of preservation. Here we have a few stages. Uh, like installations, and removal, and at some point in time we solved the biggest problem of drying it all since the system was closed, it was isolated. We had the chance to get a fixed amount of wet moisture per unit of time. We could also do it when wet wood was still wet and when the wood was still already frozen and we found a very cheap, cheap way to do it without using any expensive uh, machinery, freezing machinery. Every city has uh, industrial fridges which keep uh, goods at minus 20, minus 30 below zero uh, and uh, we found a freezing machinery like that and frozen wood if you set a freezing trap at a lower temperature even then re 
at a relatively slow rate from the frozen wood every day we could get a fixed amount of moisture from the wood so that the process of moisture removal from the wood would be even. This is what it looked like, this process. We had this carcass inside. I think you do know the Alizarov method where he puts bones together. So they're fixing this carcass. It's like the same carcass, but for a boat. It has uh, stops uh, that fix uh, uh, the boat in place and that can to keep it from shaking. The boat was put in this carcass, the carcass was placed in a tube. This tube was a major polyethylene water pipeline about 80 centimeters in di diameter which cost next to nothing oh, in mass production it can hold up to 10 bar of pressure we can do not only some things under pressure but we can also vacuumize this volume and uh, this is uh, our system where we this is the second container or any space where we prepare different mixtures, solutions that are blown by nitrogen to remove oxygen. And then we have oxygen sensors, some other like electric continuity or electricity, or oh, sorry, temperature sensors. And from this container, we can feed into our chemical reactor any volume or we can adjust it and control it as we go about it. Initially we were we were planning to transport it in this nitrogen medium then we wanted to replace it with a big solution. But we found one method to determine the concentration of water in a water solution of PEG. So we weren't controlling the PEG, we were controlling the water in the water solution. There are some titration methods uh, that help you understand quite well the mass balance or the balance of masses to be controlled. So here we were controlling the process of wooden progression. This is the PEG process where it started and then a controlled wood drying check. The first one, op the first option is similar to the method I was told in the Hermitage in the lab of organic preservation when you're wrapping up something in a piece of cloth or fabric and then in um, and then there is uh, bags of sand. It's very slow because of the redistribution of the bulk of uh, moisture. It's very slow. It's very slow. So if you can control how moisture leaves at uh, the item, even at the regular temperatures like uh, 50 grams of water per day removed, in a so it's a proportional redistribution of moisture within the item. This is what I'm talking about. And this was the second option. So it's a big industrial fridge or freezer and the tube was put inside of it uh, from uh, a pipe from a major water pipeline. Inside there is cool nitrogen circulating over the frozen, circulating over the frozen wood and this cold nitrogen then it goes to an even cooler trap where the excess is well basically frozen out and then we can control the rate at which uh, moisture is removed from this whole uh, process. 
no talk about controllers, no talk about uh, software or hardware. It's like a, sm like a smart house technology, but uh, in our terms, there is parameter control and there is feedback. Basically, you can use your smartphone to regulate it, to navigate through it. There are some functional things, but I don't think you want to hear about it. And the next thing, no, 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 let's keep going. And these are the expected uh, results. The Museum of the Sea Ocean placed an order, we worked on it, we gave them a quotation, the cost uh, associated with the materials and equipment, hardware that would be needed. Do you know how much we came at? For 150,000 rubles. Imagine that. This is what it cost for 150,000 rubles. Back then, now it's, I think, 700 to 600,000 rubles. Very cheap. This is the cost. Excluding the works, I mean, the set cost that. Sergei Maratovich, any samples? Me and my students are now putting together a working small desktop mock-up model of that. Well, when, when there is a working model, we will let you know. The main idea behind that is that it's a reactor, basically, a chemical reactor that can be adjusted to any material and set the parameters of the exchange of masses or any other, or some other process. Well, thank you for your attention, it says. Sergei Maratovich, thank you. To the questions. I have read an article of what you t I've read an article and uh, yeah that was my article and it's in your report as a great article the museum of the world ocean uh, declined the application they didn't reach they, they, they cannot uh, reach an agreement on how to transport this sample outside of outside of the region that's it day one of the completion of the conference is complete loads of interesting reports and we can see that the archaeological wood is well preserved in the in the wet condition and in the other sources in different problems uh, large-scale structures preservation problems preservation of joint wood and with metal the problem of control over the process of conservation, conduct of the research work is also a problem. We were studying the very, um, very full and very packed word uh, day, actually. And uh, while we were discussing um, some, we misunderstood. Uh, the report when Natalia Valencina was telling on the use of the water and spirit based solution and impregnation with polymers. This story was related to the to the wood.